I'm here. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Deepest Law. I'm here with... What's so funny? You, what you, you, you almost forgot for a second. I think you were about to go into your uh, a, a Dark Souls comment there. No? What? what I, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? <laughs> Dark Souls rubbish. Uh, it doesn't play Dark, Dark Souls. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, uh, we are... Uh, gathered here once again i have a big mug of Ness cafe gold and it's um and it is time ladies and gentlemen to talk about clothing now uh you, i'm told mr d will be along later uh, he has got some uh business to attend to apparently but uh, he will be along in about an hour um but first of all uh pharaoh uh what gave you the idea for talking about clothing today? Uh, well, there's a couple of things. I think, firstly, you mentioned um, for your kind of uh, New Year's resolutions, you're trying to dress a little bit better. And then, secondly, I heard the curse story about you going to Waitrose in your flat cap, Jack Willis uh, hoodie, <laughs> yeah. and practically bottoms. And, you know, I just felt very sorry for you at that point and thought, uh, you know, this man needs some... Uh, some advice, but also, but also, it's interesting. On, on if you if you tune into Tuesday's stream with with uh, where Carl was going on a bit of a rant about standards, and, and as much as I, you know, I disagreed with much he said that night, but uh, he made some interesting points around standards, and uh, you know, I think there's a definite slip in standards in the way that we present ourselves, in the way that we look. So, you know, I thought this could be an interesting dive into. Where is that? What's the cause of that, and how can we pull that back a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of interesting because um, I would blame the pandemic for a slip in my, you know, the reason I was out in that kind of slack wear was because I hadn't <laughs> been out for a week. You know, um, I don't know about you guys, but I have found that since the lockdown has started, there's there been a definite slide in clothes selection. Um, even down to like, uh, I mean, it's, it's eased up a bit recently, obviously, hasn't it? You know, because we, uh, but um, I have definitely found that you find yourself uh, choosing kind of more casual options just because you're not going anywhere most of the time. Um, what about you two? Have you found, has the lockdown had any discernible impact on the way you dress? Uh, I mean, I, I, have an office at the end of the garden so I sort of dress up every single day and pretend like I'm going to work anyway so it's not affected me that much but I think certainly in terms of you know going to restaurants and going out you, you, you do miss those formal occasions where you would dress up a little bit better so uh, I, I think you're probably right. But then um, I have I mean I have been known to be a snappy dresser at other times in my life. Um, I always remember some random comments uh that stick with you. Um, but uh, I remember one of my good, one of my friend's mothers always said, oh, you know, you've got nice clothes. I bet, I bet you do all right with the girls, which was uh, <laughs> thinking back on, oh, that's thinking, good. Back, yeah. thinking back on it. That was a bit of an odd comment from my uh, <laughs> mate's mother, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I've, I've also, I also went through a, rather large period of uh, mainly wearing tweed blazers of course uh with a little handkerchief um in the in the top pocket it's quite but, admirable uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah that was my that was my kind of unofficial uniform for about a decade um but now i'm looking to yeah you know, I, I would say having children as well makes it about twice as hard because 
as soon as I get down and like go down in the morning, you've got a nice pair of tra- trousers on, instantly get the morning's breakfast on it, or uh, you know, <laughs> snot or yeah. other other uh, bodily fluids from your child well, on it. So I, I I've definitely got a pair of uh, chinos that I wear that um, you know by lunchtime has already got like. <laughs> A bit, a bit of kind of tomato covered macaroni on it or whatever whatever it happens to be you know um but anyway why don't we uh we'll make a start here um so let us uh get this open hold on yes so uh this you've just got this section called start fair why don't you tell us what's what we're looking at here yeah, but just kind of following on with this idea of standards, um, you know, when I last talked about this, just casually for a couple of minutes on a previous stream, there were some quite negative comments in the um, in the uh, chat afterwards, and you know, I was getting accused of kind of being a being a bit of a snob, uh, etc., which I don't mind at all, which is true, but um, but people did talk about how it was kind of like an attack on the working class, and I, th- I thought this was very interesting because again, if you've uh, if you kind of remember back to the kind of excellent 1910 walk through London stream with Deep Anima and yourself, you know, just the quality of dress and the kind of aesthetics that people had um, less than 100 years ago is, is far superior to, to today. So I just wanted to kind of start off with just just showing that actually um, the, the way that the working, dr- uh, working class dressed in the 1910s is probably better than the average Middle class person today, so I've just I just managed to find a few kind of like uh, very old photos. Um, uh, I would like to clear up a couple of misnomers here. I can see in the in the chat from some of the trucks. Um, someone says, "I bet AA is the kind of guy to wear an ironic T-shirt with a blazer." No, 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 no. <laughs> my my typical outfit was oh, an entropy is open by the way. You can also get that in the um, down in the down the show notes, it's the very last link. I'll just drop it in the chat again. I know some people like to use entropy. Um, but um, no, I mean, my, my basic uh, outfit was a white shirt from a place called T. Lewin. I'd, I'd T.M. Lewin. Wear, yeah, T. M. Lewin. Uh, yeah, T. Yeah. M. Lewin, yeah. Um, I typically wear a pair of uh, beige chinos, probably from Marks and Sparks, but... Uh, you know, other other Chino brands are available, with a with a pair of loafers, and a and a blazer. That was a kind of my typical typical outfit that I wore for a very long time. Um, I also went through. Pe- I also went through a period of instead of the chinos, I'd wear um, corduroys, like a kind of mustard coloured corduroys, or uh, if I had mm. various different colours corduroys um, that I'd wear with my uh, you know various different tweed blazers, but. A lot of those clothes are so essentially since the lockdown has happened um i feel like i need to get a new wardrobe a lot of my clothes are getting quite old and i want to level up i want to move on from that basic look to get a three-piece suit or something like that so um uh, anyway um well let us have a look then at who do you want to start with the miners yeah just go to go for miners first yeah so this is what miners would be wearing. What kind of gear is this? Would you say? It's just a, yeah, just a standard th- three piece seat. So you can see they've got uh, the kind of waistcoat. Um, you know, this is probably probably wool as well. So, so uh, I, I was speaking to to D about this, and he described how the miners would probably you know strip down quite a lot to work in the mines, um, but then yeah. come come home, get changed, and then go straight to the pub afterwards. So you can see their faces are still kind of blackened with the coal dust. But um, you know they dressed up quite, you know, <laughs> snappily. I think for uh, um, for the pub. But yeah, everyone's in a flat cap. Everyone's got a tie as well. Um, you know, o- overall, e- and also even the kids as well. So you know, there's lots of like ch- children doing um, kind of some of the smaller jobs. Um, even they are dressed in in suits, which I find a little bit strange, but uh, still interesting. There was some. Um, um, yeah. Well, the, the thing is as well. Uh, prior to um, just around the sort of uh, post World War II period, there was this conception that that a suit wasn't simply a suit; it was a suit of clothes. So, so to be dressed in your clothes meant, you know, shirt, trousers, waistcoat, jacket, essentially. So, um, for example, if you read 
uh, literature uh, from this period or for, from that very broad period, then, um, for example, the most recent example I can think of is uh, uh, Nut Hamson's Hunger, um, which Pharaoh's friend Alexander actually uh, recommended, um, in which the main character is kind of this starving writer uh, who uh, sells his waistcoat for a little bit of bread, like a crust of bread. Um, and despite the fact that he's like starving to death, he remains transfixed on the fact that he's not wearing a waistcoat. Um, <laughs> and he, he sort of like clenches his, his, his blazer and coat around him to, to stop people from seeing this fact. You know, he can't bear to think of somebody like an, an, a sort of an old woman noticing he hasn't got a waistcoat on and sort of going, you know, sort of, you know, think, thinking he's a, a shameful person. No, no, someone in the chat is saying the problem is the work. Um, uh, somebody in the chat said something like, This isn't this isn't dress sense, it's all they have. What about that comment? Um, th well, the thing is, it's it's true that in effect they may only have one suit of clothes, so, so to speak, but that suit of clothes was partly through practicality because you'd wear it for whatever you were doing, or perhaps you'd have you know a suit of clothes and perhaps something for. Sundays or you know some something for weddings or funerals or whatever but um y because you only owned these things your presumably your wife or you because you know this was a time when uh most men would probably learn how to sew at some point um uh they would keep these things immaculate you know this isn't like they could pop down to Primark on the weekend and get you know a bunch of new clothes that they can spend all their free income on this is the one suit of clothes they have it has to be kept immaculate because you know like no no like even the most poor i don't know yorkshire miner wouldn't dare to be seen by sort of you know local folk or if he's going to go somewhere you know he wouldn't be dare seen in the pub or at some local event by the mayor or whatever he wouldn't dare be seen in a shabby looking suit of clothes you know they wouldn't there wouldn't be holes or dirt on it it would be kept good looking i mean what i find interesting you know we talk about uh, entropy and decline um here we have the people who were generally on the lower rungs of society, arguably dressing better than elites dress today. If you think of the typical TED talk and the yeah, kind I mean, of... Um, they, they won't be know, wearing the, ties today, so... No. You know, the, um, the open-necked jeans and trainers with T-shirt and blazer look that, yeah. is, uh, that comes from the Ca Starting California world, yeah. kind of Silicon Valley types. Um, you know, you could argue that they're more casual than this, and these are just guys. Uh, these are just guys going to the pub. So it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. just, well, I mean, just, just, sorry, go on, Fer. No, 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 you, you go. go. I was going to move things on. Well, so. I mean, in a sense, this the the reason that this uh, carries on is uh, as as in the reason these miners are dressed the way they are is basically because hundreds of years before aristocratic fashions began the trend of the sort of three piece suit. Uh, look, which then became standardized. And, you know, of course, mm. vests and obviously things like trousers and uh, jackets were pretty common before then. But the the particular style of look and the kind of minutiae of it was developed in the aristocratic classes. And then, of course, it filters down through through the other levels of, of, of society. So hence, you end up hundreds of years after with, uh, you know, miners as their basic clothing being... Um, uh that being this and you know like i think it also speaks to the fact that that if you saw a miner now you either wouldn't know his profession because he'd be dressed in like a, a t-shirt and and, and 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 jeans or whatever or he'd be wearing you know overalls uh like a special helmet like safety vis vest you know like the the kind of um class uniform is stripped away i suppose um or, or at least it's, or at least changed, so it doesn't reflect this sort of thing anymore. You could even say obscured, couldn't you? To give the illusion. Uh, I'm always yes. reminded by that uh, John Lennon line. You know, you think you're so clever and classless and free, but you're still fucking peasants, as far as I can see. Never a true word spoken by John Lennon. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the the casualization of all of culture helps to mask that, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, just by the style of cap here, you know, this is not the style of hat that would have been worn in the city, for example. No, um, yeah. As I'm sure. And this is, this... Sorry. 
there, there is there is something kind of um, localist to it at the same time. If you go back to the medieval period, for example, different nations um, were dressed entirely diff differently. So you could identify a German just by their outfit, or you could identify an Englishman. And then even within that, within certain regions, you'd identify that location. So there's something tied to a specific place and also hierarchy through clothes. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, kind of medieval sumptuary laws, um, where, so for example, Henry VIII um, said that he implemented a rule where only uh, knights or above could wear like blue velvet from <laughs> from Italy, Italy uh, and then only um, like a certain uh, nobility class could wear like golden uh, embroidered embroidered clothes. And so, as, as, soon, if, as soon as you have hierarchy, you need to kind of show that out outwardly, and that mm -hmm. filters through clothes. And that that you know you know how we talk about fashion and the idea of seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe I, th I believe it's tied to what Panama was saying about the elite sets of fashion. Then effectively, the bourgeois and the you know the, the working class try and copy that. And so, because the bourgeois are copying it, the elite has to create something else new instead. And so, this is why you have these fashion cycles where the elite are constantly trying to define themselves as different, uh, and the middle class are constantly trying to catch up. Yeah, and um, in fact, I. Uh, I, I, I stumbled across a strange version of that recently um, because uh, we've been looking at either like nurseries or childminder or, or something for or, or a play group or something for AAA um, uh, to have somebody to play with essentially, you know, to um, for socialization given that uh, live most of your life in, in lockdown. And I think they were saying that um, one of the things you have to consider with that is who is the peer group going to be, even at that age, right? Mm. And um, where Mrs. A's mother was saying that um, there's been a switch in where. So once upon a time, to send your uh, send your little one to a nursery would have been uh, they would have avoided doing that, uh, and they would have got like somebody private to come and help in the in the home or whatever. Um, but now that it is the complete opposite so all of the because all of the women of a certain class will be at work so they go to the nursery and all of the all of the other ones will go to the i think it's the play group is that the one where parents are actually there as well i think it's called a play group um yeah, I, I got it, taken there as a kid yeah so I, that has switched around apparently so uh i just thought right. it was a kind of in interesting thing that they're always trying to um they're always trying to keep like one step ahead all the time. Um, but anyway, ca carry on. Um, shall we have a look at some more more of these? Yeah, sure, sure. There we go. Oh, so, so, yeah. so this was kind of like a mixed group of people, but you can see like you'd have like the um, the foremans uh, dressed a little bit nicer than some of the other guys there, but you've still got the kind of uh, uh, you know dirty, cold face miners next to you. know, there's a guy with a pocket watch on the right hand side and smoking a pipe. And he's obviously maybe like a clerk or something. So uh, it, it's interesting because there's definite, you can tell the class of someone just by looking at them or their, their kind of wealth, but there is still like a connection and unity between them at the same time. So, you know, they're all English and they're all, you know, whatever from Wales or the North. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and again, I think that's the power of clothes. It, um, it helps create those groups and community cohesion. I think, I think part of this new emergent, international elite is again these international styles where you can pick up a you can pick up some clothes from um i don't know nike in china and then you can you can wear it wherever you like in the world and you, you don't look out of place if that makes sense mm -hmm. i like this what this strap's wearing here you can yeah. see his little, yeah, he's, uh... he's going yeah i mean uh, yeah it looks to be a sort of uh uh patterned waistcoat there um i mean you know but the the, the interesting thing is that he isn't necessarily like an, a higher class of these men, you know. He, he he appears to be quite comfortable among them. So it's possible he's just you know a a, a laborer that like in, inherited a, a nice waistcoat or you know saved is, up for one. I don't know. Is that a minor bird there? What was what's this trap? It there? looks yeah, like it. Maybe. Yeah, pit canary. I, I was thinking it could also be a one of those cheese rack uh, toaster racks. <laughs> uh, I don't about, know about that. Do <laughs> just, about yeah, just. Racks? 
proudly proudly displaying his toast rack there to the camera. You know, this, the, 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 this, this is the, the the best toast rack in the entire of Lancashire or something. It, this guy here looks like he could throw a punch to me. Yeah, he's quite, quite streetwise, aren't they? Quite quite stacked. Um, There's um, I we we may have brought this up in the uh, London stream we did, but um. There's a Jonathan Bowden talk where he mentions uh, an author who talked about the decline of the English face. Um, this, this, <laughs> this, this, this idea that that you can actually see how we're de sort of decaying by how people's faces look. And, you know, like these are the sort of uh, plebeian class of the society of this time. And yet I think in most of the men stood here, there's a sort of strength and a particular sort of look and a sort of uh, some sort of uh, almost mystical element to the way their faces look and the way they're expressing themselves to the camera. That if you did this now with a bunch of men and men from the street, would be completely changed. You know, the the faces would be sort of sl uh, sloppier. They'd be fatter. They'd be sort of you know so doing it, those big soy grins. And I mean, and this is a, this is a kind of tricky topic, but I, I definitely remember um, I was walking in the. We, we, I can't remember where we went. It was this duck pond or something. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of, um, let's just say, rougher types around there. And you can definitely see in there, like, you can just, if you just did a photo parade, you could spot those faces. Yeah. Um, it's like a kind of bulldog face, if that makes any sense, where you think this looks like degeneration here. Um, but you can't see any of those faces in, in here. There's no, There's none of those kind of you know the talk you know the it's the north fc north, north fc yeah and yeah. i mean these like these these men literally are like north fc's great grandfathers but you know they don't look like him because they because these men don't spend their lives down the pub on the sofa eating like enormous quantities of food and watching football you know that's that's why they don't look like that. Yeah, I mean, th those faces are the result of many, many Chinese takeaways and yes, and <laughs> being an adult and, for thirty years and things. And I mean, you know, um, there's like uh, George Orwell uh, notes in uh, Road to Wigan Pier that he, when he went down the mine, and he he noted that the miners, as Ferris said, would work naked um, mostly when they were down at the pit face because it was so hot that down there. It was you know. You hmm. literally you couldn't have a scrap of, of clothing on you. Um, and he said that the wastes and the sort of stomach of the miners, he said he'd never seen wastes that were so like uh, uh, trim and that there was sort of not not like an ounce of, of, of fat on these men, you know, because the the work they were doing was so labor intensive. So, you know, you you aren't going to have uh, sort of North FC looking men, are you, if, if, if that's the level of the work. And I think the same applied to. Uh, not just mining, but a lot of standard jobs uh, in England at the time, you know, or in the Western world at the time, whether it was in a factory or in a in a dockyard or a works or whatever, you know, you'd be doing labor that that would essentially keep you in in tip top physical condition, e even if you weren't being nourished particularly well. I, I'm looking now, honest chin, honest chin, honest chin. Mm -hmm. He's got an honest chin. He's got an honest chin. Honest chin. This one. Possibly imbecile. But, yeah. <laughs> well, it may it may just be the unfortunate angle, you know. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, let us uh, let us move mm -hmm. on. Um, also, um, I, I, just another point about this 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 sort of clothing from uh, the sort of mid Victorian period up to the end of the Second World War. There's this thing that men in particular, specifically men, aren't meant to show the base of the neck for, for, for whatever reason. Um, the lower part of your neck is considered uh, uh, it's considered sort of disreputable if you have that showing in public. So you'll notice that even if they don't have a tie, they'll have the top button of their shirt done up always. What was the thinking behind that? I, I'm not quite sure where it comes from. Um, I think it may have just sort of come from the fact that, you know, I mean, if, if you look at collars from the sort of uh, Victorian period onwards to the end of the war, they're very high, very stiff, and they cover l most of the neck, you know. Um, and it wasn't until kind of the more libertine times after the First World War, and then again after the Second World War, that it became acceptable to just have your top button undone. Well, I, uh, I think the seventies was very big on the 
on the unbuttoned shirt and medallion sort of look. Uh, well, I mean, by by then it's all it's all gone, you know, isn't it? Yeah. I've, seen, I've, I've seen pics of my dad uh, from the seventies wearing flares, mm -hmm. afro, <laughs> proper med like prop like moustache, medallion. You know, um, this was a this was a period where there was more of that. Um, but uh, I don't think the buttoned up collar ever really came back, did it? Everybody's been very kind of cash since the seventies, I would say. Mm. Not all uh, of us. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I say, I say <laughs> everyone. I mean, you know, the vast majority of people have been. Yeah. More. I mean, I mean, I mean, Boris is quite famous, for example, for not really wearing a tie very much. I'd or, say. Or, or 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 also deliberately having messy hair. A yeah. Kind of contrived look. Apparently, mm. it's just to do Boris's hair. I read somewhere. Yeah, it's a, it's it's it's, it's, it's all an it. act. It's all an act. It's not it's not any kind of like pro pro professorial scruffiness. You know, it's 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 all an act. So let's um, so let's have a look. I mean, these guys are even at work, and they're looking. There you go. Yeah, I, I love the the bowler hats. Again, there, there's yes. a, there is a time where you just see like a sea of bowler hats in town, and uh, you know, that's also a again, fine horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the left there. Uh I just just one more point on those men there. Uh the the thing to add as well is that these days, because they're sort of reserved for formal occasions, like a three piece suit is seen as a very impractical thing to wear, you know. Like you wouldn't ever wear it for manual labor. But the thing is that in a case like this, the, the material it was made of and the the fits of them and how they were worn, three piece suits like this are some of the most practical things you can wear, you know. The, they they keep you covered. They keep you warm. They got plenty of pockets, you know. And let, let's let's not forget this was an age prior to central heating. You know, it, it it wasn't comfortable for most of the time in England to just sit around in a house in what what would you know the, the level that people do now in just a shirt or a sort of t shirt or whatever. You know, like it wouldn't you 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 you'd freeze basically. So the, these clothes are actually extremely practical. Um, I think some people always confuse them with sort of a modern three piece suit that's sort of you know the, the the material is very easy to get to get torn or or, or dirty, and it's it's not something you never wear to do labour. So, I, I I do wonder whether it's a, a just a factor of our times where we'll buy stuff off the shelf as opposed to um, where everything's tailored. Basically, even even these kind of clothes will be made more made to measure than uh, you know what we buy today. And so I think people often end up buying the wrong fit or the wrong size mm. for their bodies. Well, again, like. Uh, you know, these guys are working practically in, uh, you know, s certainly in a jacket and wa um, a waistcoat and, and thick. Those would be thick wool as well. Very um, thick, yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking at pictures of Tony Blair now, and um, he he very often goes for this look. Hold on. Oh, no, we don't have to look at pictures of Tony Blair again. It's... <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me just show you, though, just so oh. Let me just see. Oh. Top, the top button undone. Yeah. Top button, and I mean, so this, this is very, di very dishonest face, by the way. I'm, a, I'm, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of that uh, quotation from the start of the abolition of Britain. I'm a modern man, you know. Yeah. I'm a modern. Man. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's uh, let's carry on. So, um, so th we're moving up now, or is no? These are still working. These are still, these, these, yeah, these are still, yeah, still textile that workers. But I just wanted to show a couple of different industries as well. So again, it's not. Because again, this is indoors, and it'll be really hot inside this space. But they're still wearing yeah. the, the, the waistcoat. But again, they've got the the, the lack of um, tie, and I think that is definitely a, a kind of a visual marker between. Uh, you, obviously, you've got the kind of blue collar and uh, white collar comes from you know this decade where you're the collar that you wear sort of de yeah. denotes the kind of class of labourer you are. This chap here looks like he might be handy in an arm wrestling match. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. More yeah, this, this is a little bit later. I think this is like forties, but even like woodworking, they've they've got an apron on. But if you have a look, they're still wearing a waistcoat and uh, waistcoat and shirt. So it's literally all mm -hmm. all types of labour. No, no, the, no. The waistcoat did make quite a drastic comeback in the past few years due to um, Gareth Southgate and the uh, England football. One of the team. reasons. Um, I mean Southgate. Was often seen rocking the waistcoat, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. But now, now one sees a waistcoat quite often. Um, trying to think, I'm, I'm pretty sure that 
DS Arnott in uh, well, Line of Duty often, say, yeah. often wears a waistcoat, doesn't he? Very, very uh, jazzy. Well, I mean, I I always have a waistcoat on. Um, I'm, I'm just I'm just like used to it now. I mean, it, I, it's 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 I I don't really understand why they went away for for so long. To be honest with you, they're very comfortable. They're very practical, and they keep you looking much smarter. You know, um, generally. Uh, with the exception of some things, than uh, than the average sort of uh, two piece look does. Although I I have to say I'm I'm a bit of a fuddy duddy when it comes to dress. I mean I still wear a sort of a, a suit style clothing all the time. Um, and uh, I actually I actually go to the trouble of having all my collars uh, starched and uh, stiffened, and I I collect sort of uh, older styles of, of shirt collars and things like that. Wow. How do you do um, the starch on the on the collar? Then? So um, starching a collar. So basically, you can get this very cheap stuff in a can called spray starch. Um, if the collar isn't detachable, where you just sort of put the shirt on an ironing board, spray the starch on, and then iron the starch into the collar and let it dry. But the proper way to do it, um, and this is something you want to have a laundry do. You don't want to probably do this yourself unless you've been doing it for a very long time. Um, you need to uh, so you so the collar is detachable from from the shirt, and then you basically wash it, uh, clean it, and then you you dip you you mix up a solution of starch. There's it's like white uh, powdery starch. You mix it into water. You dip the collar into it, and then press the collar into the shape you want it to be, and then you just and then you leave it dry, and you've got a stiff cardboard esque sort of collar. It has the it has the sort of touch of cardboard to it, but. Um, it's a lot more comfortable than it sounds. Um, now, I have to say that the starch going away was a major point of decline in menswear um, because uh, it basically, like, there was... A, so, for example, um, you know in Charlie Chaplin films where he's playing the tramp? Um, mm -hmm. And if, if you look closely in that, you'll notice that he's, you know, this completely impoverished character on the very lowest rung of of society yet he always has this very stiff little collar on and it was considered such a point of pride to have sort of a big stiff collar in these periods that um that even tramps like him would literally spend like part of whatever money they could beg or whatever they could sort of scratch together on taking their collars to a laundry to have them cleaned and starched um you know that was how big of a deal it was for men to have a starched collar um and it just sort of vanished after the war when uh sort of, you know, off uh, off the peg packet shirts came in, you know, where you, you know how if you go into Marks and Spencer's now, you can buy like th just like th three shirts in a pack, you know, like mm -hmm. that, that that came in and basically starching went away. And also, of course, um, a lot of men, their, their wives would starch their cuffs and collars for them. Um, mm -hmm. And with the advent of the working woman, the woman isn't around to starch uh, collars and cuffs anymore because it, it is quite a long process. Um, it's not quick. There's a technolo technology thing as well where there's been advances in materials. So again, you'll have self stiffening um, collars and stuff like that being used. So mm -hmm. you don't have to um, you don't have to do it as much. So I, th I think what, well, but it's it's never quite as as you know, it's not quite as good as a proper starch collar though. So it's it's interesting. I think people have just sort of like you said, habits have changed, and so they thought, oh, we can just get away with uh, no. a lower quality. I, mm -hmm. I can see someone in chat saying most men don't even know how to iron. Um, I have to say, cl the clothes realm is something I won't get involved with. I've had a long-standing rule that I don't iron, and I won't get involved in washing clothes. Uh, I'll do cooking, and I can help out with cleaning or whatever, but I, I refuse to do that. And I even uh, actually um, employed someone to do uh, that stuff for a period. Um, where you know you would, they basically like come and do the cleaning, and as part of it, they did mm. they did the ironing as well. Um, but in fact, they spend most of their time on the ironing because it takes quite a long time to iron. But uh, yeah, that, that's a job I won't do. Uh, so, um, I just uh, it's not. I, I did get my ironing badge back in Cub Scouts, but uh, yeah, I it, was uh, not really taught to thing. iron, taught to iron in boarding school. Um, because uh, you were either a, uh, if you'll excuse the term, uh, you were either a young fag who had to iron clothes for older boys, or you were in the middle school, so you had to iron your own clothes. Um, that was basically how it was. So you you, you were taught to iron there. Um, <laughs> that's basically how. But uh, 
yeah, like 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 you, up until uh, COVID came around, I I used uh, uh, a laundry service basically to do ironing. Oh, Take, just, takes too much time. It's just very time consuming. Yeah, and uh, Mrs. AA, uh, who occasionally uh, you know who does the ironing, essentially, she takes hours on a uh, on um, things like sheets and like the bedding and things. Takes about like it takes about two hours. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, if, I, if that was a, ser- I would if there was a service where they could just go and press everything, I would use it uh, if such a thing exists. So um, anyway, anyway, Miss A finds it kind of relaxing to iron. I find it faff to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, shall we move on from these fellows? Um, mm-hmm. Let's go. Okay, yeah, so, so this, an, this, this yeah, this is more middle class now. I've got a couple of middle class and some upper class people as well, but. Um... Why are these chaps Italian? Why do they look Italian to me? Um, I mean, they could they could be, but I, I did. I was just searching for nineteen uh, tens middle class, middle class was the search term. So I think it's the, the moustache style. Just say, I'm sure I've seen Italians from this era with that moustache style. Uh, yeah, it, it could the, be. I, okay, I, I so think what, interesting. The, the, the signs what? that they're different is basically if you look at the shoes. So if you see the shoes of the previous guy, they're all they're always covered in mud and and dirt. But it's also the little, the little uh, again. The, the collars are more complicated. This is this is a little bit later. Uh, the more intricate ties, and so it's very much the details, but the fundamentals are, are very similar. So again, I think that's where there's that connection, the unity between the classes through dress, but there is also through through um, hierarchy at the same time. I always remember um, being told, you know, they look at your shoes. That's how they really can tell. Um, mm-hmm. But I've always been a bit kind of, I tend not to buy my own clothes. My mother bought my clothes and then my partner has tended, you know, whether it was my first or first wife or Mrs. A.A. Um, generally have, uh, you know, picked out clothes because I just find that uh, I'm like, um, and also because I'm a bit colorblind, um, I need all of my clothes to be like pre, like to be like idiot proof in a way so I can pick any two things out and they all. They all kind of match. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I've tended to outsource uh, clothes s- selection, but this time, uh, when I get when I next go, I may uh, I may break from that um, based on uh, based on the things I'll be learning today. Um, but uh, yeah, the shoes um, is that still the case? I think it is still the case, isn't it? That uh, you know, especially when you go to like. Um, certain places but you know that there'll be people who are wearing extremely expensive shoes uh, in certain circles um well it's, it's, it's interesting because i think society has fundamentally changed where <clears throat> in, in in the past um there, there is this idea of um conspicuous consumption you know you, you would wear high quality clothes um luxury items but you wouldn't make a big deal out of it necessarily and it was um and then maybe from a certain cut or a fit you would stand out to other elites or to the bourgeois class and be recognized. While today there is a definite move towards the more crass outward displays of, um, of luxury and showing that you're, you know, high, higher ranking. So, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, the, the hype beast, you know, that the rise mm. of Sup- Supreme and other brands mm. like that, where it's about showing in people's faces really obviously that you have bought a certain item and th- through right. over the top brand branding, like noticed how none of these guys have got a brand logo no. or uh, identification to who their tailor was at all. Um, right. And the yeah. idea of, of, of showing the t- of showing the tailor would be abhor- abhorrent to them, even in the kind of early luxury of like the twenties, you know, where Chanel or whatever, uh, and the kind of French houses, they would never kind of put the, the name of the uh, the tailor on on the. Uh, yeah, like the the outside yeah. of the clothes, basically. And I, mm-hmm. I've had a I've had a very long standing rule where I don't I don't I won't wear anything which has got no uh, neither will I big you know big written across the chest or anything really that's a marker like that. Um, well, it's it's about refusing to be a, a free advertising board for a company. You know, I mean, it's 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 very very. I don't really understand why you would embrace having a brand on your clothes. I mean, it it is it, it, it's a brand, you know. It's the, it's it's like a cattle brand. It's it's you know, you don't want to but, walk around with that on you. But 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 what it, what it is, it's a move from aesthetics, where it's like 
you wear you wear clothes to again to signify who you are and and your place in society towards showing how much money you have it's just a pure um i i i earn this much cash because i wear a, a supreme or or this or i'm this exclusive it, it's a very much it's a, it's, it's a f- philosophical mindset change where it's just about showing um physical wealth but the 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 the, the consequence of this is that people are are beggaring themselves by uh you know <laughs> spending all of their you know money and credit card bills on luxury clothes that they can't afford just to yeah. try and to, to try and fit in so there's something very perverse about the mindset uh, now someone in chat has said hey, hey it's for it's for time for your shopping trip yes honey um that now it's it's a bit less like that i am an extremely difficult person to go shopping with because i have zero patience whatsoever and i resent it um so I I literally have to be dragged, miserable, um, and uh, what will happen is, is that uh, she'll pick out some clothes, and I'll be like, oh, right, let's just get this. Oh, you have to try them on. Okay, right, fine, right. How do I look? And then if they if they're like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Let's go. Let's try something else. I'll be agitating to just get that one and get out of there because I cannot stand it. Very typical, uh, mm. typical of some men in that in that regard. I've always had a very limited time for these sorts of things. So um, it tends to be that if, uh, if uh, let's say Mrs. A finds something that works or um, she'll just get like loads of the same one because we know it fits or we know it, we know it works. And then I don't, we don't have to go through the ordeal of getting me to actually go to a bloody store or, or, or whatever. Um, but um maybe i'll maybe i'll try to embrace it with a bit more patience uh in the future we'll see um i i also noticed a few um a few things here um one is that he is wearing a a bow is that a bow tie and the others are a wearing, bow tie, yeah yeah no it, what is the general idea of the bow tie versus the the, the, the normal tie there isn't really any. It's basically just an, an aesthetic choice. Uh, the bow versus the long tie. Um, in fact, the, the, it's it's essentially um, if you look at clothing from the kind of seventeen hundreds earlier uh, and earlier to then, collars didn't have buttons on them or clasps. But the 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 origin of the necktie was a piece of fabric that held your collar closed at the top, um, which is where they came from. Uh, and the style of necktie that we have nowadays and that you see them wearing here um, originated, I believe, from some students at Cambridge um, in the mid to early 1800s who removed the ribbon from their hats and tied them around their collars to keep warm on a cold day, um, which then morphed into the kind of sort of thin uh, style of long necktie. But um, it's literally just a, a matter of how you want to fill that gap that is between the top of the waistcoat and jacket and the collar and the neck. Um, that's basically what you're looking to influence there. That's that yep. you're looking to control that space. Now, how do you feel about the fact that the, the bow tie these days is almost exclusively worn by libertarians? Uh, I don't, I don't, I think well, it, it's, it's not that it's worn by libertarians. It's that it's worn by tasteless li- libertarians is the problem. Um, I mean, there is a certain vibe that uh, the sort of mid-century li- libertarians had, the likes of sort of uh, Rothbard and that that lot that that sort of it, it worked for. Um, and you had sort of various traders in the eighties that pulled it off somewhat well. But um, really, I think the problem is that the the bow ties you buy now are one pre-tied and two of a very blocky, almost childish, like sort of nerdy quote style. Um, whereas if you look at the one he's wearing there. It's thinner, it's longer, it's a lot more angular and dignified. And that is the trick if you want to pull off a bow tie now, though. Generally, um, there's a lot of sort of uh, um, people into sort of more formal menswear that encourage people to wear the bow tie. I encourage you not to do it unless you know for sure it suits your look and suits your face. Um, Because the majority of people can't quite pull it off. Here's a picture of a libertarian wearing a bow tie. <laughs> I guess what's coming. That is Jeffrey. Oh, Tuck- that is Jeffrey Tucker. There you go. You see, it's that style of bow tie does not suit that look. It's it's, it's the, the bow is the too, too small. Yeah, it's too small for the collar. It's too small for his 
shoulders it's too small for his face it doesn't work at all the the, the patterning and the color is horrible um in fact there's a i'm reminded of um a part from one of pg woodhouse's uh worcester novels where bertie was uh, where uh, they they he goes to see an, an american friend of his and jeeves notices that the american is wearing a tie that's got like pictures of birds on it and jeeves faints uh because because he can't bear to see something, you know, a tie with pictures on it or little f funny patterns. Uh, it's just, it just doesn't look right. Um, and uh, so sorry to keep going, going on about this, but um, I guess this is the reason I'm here. But, uh, if you look up a picture of a Russian author called Mikhail Bulgakov, um, then you'll see, I think, uh, what a bow tie ought to look like uh, that we just don't have now. I've looked and it's very hard to get uh, those styles of ties that aren't, the sort of quote, you know, pre-tied libertarian style uh, bow tie. Okay, I've got uh, Mikhail Bukharkov. Bull, Bulgarkov. He, yeah, he seems to be rocking the old. Uh, Very fashionable man. He's rocking the old, uh, e the the old Evola style uh, monocle in, in this picture here. Yes, another another known monocle. Wearer. Although um, his monocle was totally a aesthetic, he didn't need it. Um, and there's 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 lots of funny anecdotes by Russian friends of his at the time who noted he would kind of t take it out of his eye, play with it, then put it back in his other eye uh, by mistake. See, see, see that's quite lovely. We're, you can see that it's a different like a uh, fabric mm. to, to what you'd have today, and also it's obviously been hand hand bowed. It's quite it's quite big if you see how wide that is, and it's draping down as well, so you get a larger coverage. So I think it's nice. There's there's a it's whole nice archive thing. on. Sorry, Farah. I mean. No, that's it. That's it. There's there's a whole archive on um, Google Arts of uh, rare pictures of him, and if anybody wants a guide to kind of uh, more snazzy, less stuffy, kind of like twenties era fashion, um, then definitely look at look at pictures of him because he was a he was one of the quote unquote Moscow dandies um, who were around in the Soviet twenties in the more liberal time when there was sort of this you know this movement of people expressing a wish for a return to a sort of less miserable, less communistic time. And of course they kind of were killed off when Stalin came into power. Um, although, you know, they, they, they did exist for a time. Uh, anyway, uh, the, where, where, where did we start? Sorry, you were talking about uh, the, the bow tie. Yeah, okay. One other thing to note is that, um, I don't know if this is just an act, he's got the middle button undone there. Now, I was always told to have the bottom button undone and to have, like, never do up that button and mm -hmm. have these, have these, have the others done up, but have the bottom one open. Well, what's the um, deal? Gentlemen's code these days would be to, on a double breasted suit like that, to have them all done up when you're stood up. Um, whereas, but really, I mean, you know, it's like, it's kind of up to you, depending on what, what sort of look you want to pull off. I mean, that middle button is not like the practical one. The, the, in order for it to look smart, the two, the two, well, the one on the top and the one on the bottom have to be done up, but the one in the middle doesn't. So I suppose it's almost like a little casual sort of s statement, I guess, you know? It's like keeping it undone because, I mean, the, the other thing is as well, he, this is someone that's going to be stood up and sat down you know he's going to be going between those those two positions so it's more convenient to just have to undo two than three if you see what i mean you know you can just quickly undo the one and the, and the other one without having to go for a third let's uh carry on so this is another uh set of middle class people yes yeah, so i think they're out in the countryside though uh maybe on a hunt uh, I mean, or maybe be... a... yeah sorry so, sorry sorry for, I, I keep interrupting but um the I suppose this also could be uh, a collection of upper, middle, and lower class men. Uh, this could be sort of, you know, uh, the particular workers of an estate or something, or the some people from a local parish. Yeah. I don't know. That would just be my guess. Some of this clothing looks like it might be quite hot to me. I mean... Yeah, I mean, Tweed, uh, tweed will be 100% wool, and it's a thick fabric, a thick weave fabric as well, so... Yeah, exceedingly hot, but like uh, Panama said, there's no central heating, so no. um, um, it, is, it, it is your warmth. I live, I live out in the Welsh countryside, and I have quite a lot of tweed. Um, I, w I would say that, like, I, I know England is, has a slightly different climate to Wales, but here in Wales, where it's like you go outside most times of the year, it's not that warm. 
the wind blows like hell. You know, in 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 most stuff, you're going to be freezing. In Tweed, you're perfectly fine. Um, uh, it it does get a little bit too hot in like I wouldn't wear Tweed in the summer. Um, it's just it's 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 too thick. Even though these people probably would have. Um, you know, no, the the mustache was in in this year. Whatever year. Yeah. <laughs> Look, they like the moustache. Um, this chap here, I would say, is struggling to carry off his moustache. The others all look quite. Would you say? He he stands out to me for some reason. I think the others look all look pretty good. He I is, think uh, shooed it. But um, if he if if that guy you pointed out clipped and waxed his moustache, uh, he'd probably he'd be able to pull off the one like like the chap on the left, who I'm I have to say looks incredible there in a this uh, one. looks like. No, no, the one on, stood on the left. Um, this one, yeah. Yeah, the, the cap is good. The moustache is excellent. The collar is good. I love that Norfolk um, shooting coat. He's got uh, breeches and uh, knee socks. You know, it's an excellent look. Uh, also, literally, really uh, con con contraposto pose as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Good, great Absolute great Chad. Absolute Chad. <laughs> now, this guy here, I'm probably the photographer asked him to look like that, but... In my in my view, people only stand like that in musicals. <laughs> <It's the> music, <laughs> yeah, this is a kind of background in a musical type pose. But uh, I'm guessing the photographer told him to stand like that. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, yes. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. He's he's got some strong threads as well. This guy. Um, mm -hmm. Let's carry on. I'm looking for dishonest chins. <laughs> they, all, um, they all they all look pretty honest to me. I'll also I'll also say that of course we haven't really mentioned hats properly yet, but I mean uh, back then and up until sort of the the, the wartime period, um, a hat was considered such a ubiquitous piece of clothing. You know, you wouldn't it'd be, you'd never go outside without a cap or a hat on. It just it, it wouldn't even be thinkable. You know, you it would be like walking outside without without shoes on. It 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 just wasn't done. You if you went anywhere, if if you bought if you bought uh, clothes, you'd buy a hat with them. If you for whatever occasion you'd have a hat for it, you know, whatever you were doing that that day, you'd wear a hat or a cap. That was it's just how it was. Yeah, you see, it's it's, inter it's interesting because um, I'm, would you be have the? I mean, I'm I'm not sure if I if I'd have the patience for it all. I went to a school at one. I went to a school at one point where you had to wear three different uh, items of footwear to get from the classroom to the uh, to the football pitch because um, you had to wear slippers in the classroom. You had to wear shoes like in the yard and trainers on the football pitch. So in order to get from the football pitch to the, you'd have to, ch you have to change like on mm. the side of the football pitch into your shoes. And then, you'd have to, uh, and then you'd have to put the slippers on once you got, Oh, such a pain in the ass though. Um, <laughs> God, it was a pain. But uh, anyway, um, and if the and if the if the teachers would catch you uh, breaking that, like you'd have lines or you know that is harsh. We didn't we didn't know anything like that. Yeah, I mean it was a pretty strict school to be honest. Uh, I was a uh, I was kept in for like a because when I first went there, um, they wanted everybody to have the same kind of copper play handwriting, and I I had to stay in uh, for about four or five months. Uh, learning how to write again, basically, because you, you know that you mm. had to use a fountain pen, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know they wanted the they wanted the letters like almost perfect. Um, so I'd be sitting there with a you know ancient uh, Irish nun. You know, she'd always say my writing went all the way to Swansea because it <laughs> it lent <laughs> it lent. Are you going all the way to Swansea? So I have to try to straighten my writing because it was slanting too much. But uh, mm -hmm. um, I mean, even now I can do that, but it takes so long to get all the letters right. Um, so uh, maybe I just uh, suffer from a lack of patience in general. But <laughs> um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, can, I do have nice writing if I, uh, if I put my mind to it. All right, uh, shall we carry on? Um, yeah, so I managed to find a few photos of some toffs. It's quite it's quite hard, but this is the best I can do. This is these, wonderful. I love this. Uh, these are some gents at Ascot um, in the and 1910s. Ladies. Yes, this. I mean, wow. I th this is this is absolute peak. You know, this is this is where it was at. You know, in in the day. I mean, for for a start, I I love this chap in the middle, sort of like figure and sort of get a uh, gate. It's like <laughs> he he has he looks like a cartoon of a toff. 
from this era, and that's wonderful. I think you know he completely owns that look. Uh, he's, he's like, tall, I mean, he's very, tall, he's very tall, very tall, very aristocratic, and I mean, um, something she's to. Tall. She's tall too. She, well, this, you know, this this was this was upper class genealogy prior to the First World War. You know, this is what it was like. Um, uh, you know, the women are tall and robust as as the men, although he's quite skinny. But um, yeah, that, so one thing to note is that that the particular looks of, of of formal style gents clothing is not particularly done in uh, in in the sort of grand uh, you know it's not like well, what what type of coat am I going to wear it's it's in the little things so for example the the particular way the collars look or the ties or for example you notice how the men's waistcoats have a white trim um, among the top there you can see like a white V uh, underneath the tie that or the fact that the trousers are perfectly creased and flare out slightly at the bottom or the fact that the sleeves are very large at the end but they're thin at the elbow um, the the absolutely crucial thing to understand about menswear like this is that is that is that you know it's these little things that really make you look good you know like um for example the 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 uh, a good example that, pe that people will know nowadays is if you look at like a convention of like young republicans or like young conservatives you know they you'll you'll see all these like young boys who have gone out and bought like a suit from marks and S S spencers and they look they they look even though you couldn't perhaps name what what they're doing wrong, they always look bad. They look cheap. They look unprofessional. They don't look good in them. And the reason is that they don't understand how to make the minutiae work. And you know, the thing is, if you know what you're doing, you can buy a sort of cheap off the peg suit and make it look like like you spent hundreds of uh, or, or or even like thousands on it. You know, that's uh, that's that's the trick. And these things can't really be taught either. You you sort of have to pick them up from sort of researching this. And uh, if you have a sort it's of great, traditional yes. family member, uh, depending on where, where you grew up, then 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 they can help. They can sort of help you with it. I mean, I had uh, um, an uncle who 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 adhered to these codes long after they died, and so I learned everything from him. You know, the sort of uh, minutiae of how to do it. Um, and also, I mean. Some, some, just something else to note quickly about these chaps is that these are men of leisure. These are gentlemen. They are probably uh, titled men. They don't have to do manual labor, and yet, like, I'd say they're like, like they're they're in very, very good shape. You know, they're all sort of like washboarded and trim, and they sort of they they have a they have a they have a sort of uh, uh, wiry health to them. You know, that I think that. Just even even a sort of healthy person now, uh, who sort of kept themselves in shape, wouldn't be able to really get this sort of look. It's it's one gleaned from eating particular types of food and living a certain way that that just isn't really that easy to replicate now. I don't think Cause, because because they still would be relatively active, wouldn't they? Kind of visiting would. the estate and uh, mm -hmm. walks and all all that kind of stuff. And like you said, it's a certain uh, diet of. Probably like mainly, it's quite keto. I imagine quite like meat, meat related. Well, from, from the, the, the estate, so possibly. And I mean, of course, the the the, the irony of is that presumably this is an Edwardian picture, and the Edwardian period was extremely sort of gluttonous, especially if you were in the in the upper classes. You know, you had like about ten separate meals a day. You know, uh, as as a matter of course. So, you know, yeah. There's a whole there's a whole thing about the time that people let people ate. Um, that Mrs. A.A.'s and her parents were always going on about. But, uh, you know, I think um, if you were uh, in the working in the working class, you'd probably eat earlier and they'd call mm -hmm. it tea or whatever. Um, but if you were from a kind of well-off background, they'd eat later, like eight or maybe even later, and they'd call it supper. So. Yes, that's true. And um, just on a, a side, um, I noticed that somebody in the chat mentioned Sargon looking quite bad in a suit. Um, and looking sort of too short and, and portly for it. But if you go back a few pictures to those chaps that you said were Italian, um, sat in the chairs, uh, if you look at the chap on the left here, he's he's quite sort of portly looking. You know, he, he has a sort of bulk to him. But you can you can still be portly and pull off a suit very well. It, it just has to be fitted right. It has to look right on you. It, it really, it doesn't matter whether you're tall and thin or short and fat you can if, if you know what you're doing you'll look good that's the thing so 
with it's it's it, it, it's it's not it's not that he is too chunky for a suit. It's that he just he went into Marks and Spencers, I think, and probably bought a cheap off the peg suit rather than you know rather than do, taking steps to make sure it looked good. Yeah, and uh, I was going to um, I was going to say uh, you were mentioning about Americans wearing suits, so I'll never forget. Um, I had a I had a uh, class before that I used to take. Um, to watch uh, various productions in London, like theatre productions. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were mainly American students who would come for an exchange for like a semester, you know. Um, and they'd, uh, they'd come and do my uh, course and we'd, we'd, we'd go and watch various plays. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, while well, this one class had quite a lot of, uh, you know, 17, 18 year old Americans in it, yeah. uh, uh, boys, and they were kind of, um, they weren't the sort of uh, lads who would uh, who were used to, you know. I think they were all doing like economics or business or whatever. Right. But they were just picking up one because the, the American system is a bit different. You can pick and mix a bit more. They mm. all came wearing tuxedos because they thought it was the done thing. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> it was. It That's was. Like it was too much, too, I, too much Downton Abbey. I thought. I thought it was cute though because they were, they were watching them all file in wearing tuxedos in the middle of London in. Less yeah, than no, as if, as if you know. Yeah, it was, it was. It was. I don't know. I it was. A, I find. I find it quite endearing though, because they were trying to. They were trying to be kind of correct and proper type thing, but uh, yeah, seeing them, all, seeing them all come in in full tuxes is. Uh, there something. are there are there are a few places that you do that still like the Royal Opera House has pretty high standards. I'd say. Yeah. Have you ever been? Um, uh, I mean, there was. Uh, uh, I had a when I was at university. Um, I had a friend who basically for, for a bit of a laugh, cause it was just sort of a fun thing to do, uh, you know, and it was sort of like, uh, sort of trad laughing essentially. But we, we used to go to the, um, uh, Welsh national opera in Cardiff where we were at university and, uh, and we used to go in white tie, uh, <laughs> just, just for sort of, you know, <laughs> just, you know, just, just for a bit of fun, really. It's it, just an excuse to wear white tie, uh, O opera is like the only arts form where that sense of dress has been retained. It's very, it's very interesting because there's literally no, like uh, classical music or like uh, uh, theatre. You can wear what you like, but um, mm -hmm. it's, it's right. interesting. Let's 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 move on. Um, so here are some more. This is a uh, uh, king and queen Alexandra, prince and princess of Wales, and the king and queen of Norway. What were they yeah, I, I, just, I just I just wanted to highlight, obviously, like even the royal elite is quite similar to your kind of upper class ascot chap. So, mm. you know, it's it, it's I, I find it interesting that uh, it's not such a big a gap at that level, but the gap between the middle class and the uh, working class is quite substantial. I um I worked at Royal Ascot once. Did I tell you that? No, no. Uh, yeah, I uh, I um. Well, in fact, I, I, I did a whole spell working at various race courses. I'm sure I've told the story before because it's one of the proudest moments of my life when I was working on the pork stand at uh, Royal Ascot. Um, <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a guy came up to me and said, I've been a butcher for 60 years and you've got a very natural carving motion. I there mean, you go. That's, <laughs> that's, in my top, that's in my top 10 life achievements. That, that is. Mr. Um, Mr. Trick there, eh? You could have had I, must have told, I must have told that story a hundred times just because I'm so proud of it. <laughs> long time viewers probably press one if you hear that story before i'd be so surprised if i hadn't uh mentioned that on air before because <laughs> i just um like you know, got a natural carving motion 60 years of butcher um but uh but yeah um yeah I, I um uh i went yeah there we go pose like yeah i've heard that before loads of ones <laughs> um uh I, I also, it's the only time I've ever done any waiting in my entire life, um, was working on those uh, race courses. And I remember once we were at Epsom, or there would, it was Kempton, I was the one I was up most, but I think it was like, Arab, they call it Arab racing one day, um, yeah. where all of the, the Saudis come in on, um, and I think there was going to be like a pretty important fellow there. We all had to wear white kid gloves, and Mark, we, you know, we kind of they marched us in. We weren't allowed to look anyone. Um, and we'd have to, like, uh, give everything in a certain order and then walk back out again. Um, I remember David Meller, the um, 
Tor- you know, the former Tory MP was there. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so any time I've ever done any waiting was there. And I think, um, uh, so we did, we did that once, the Arab racing thing. And then another time, um, I just had like a, a one hour spell where I had to fill in wait it, uh, waiting in, you know, one of these places where people would buy. I remember I had a 17 pound tip. That was, uh, that was my, wow. my top tip. Um, but, uh, Very good. yeah, I have to say though, uh, I've, Royal Ascot, everybody dressed to the nines. Um, I saw some disgraceful behavior at Royal Ascot, like disgraceful behavior, you know, like, um, like I, stuff I couldn't even believe was going on debauchery and uh, the women, uh, women weeing. And it was just like, what the hell is this? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's the people still have this idea. I mean, there's like, um, I think it was actually you, um, Pharaoh that asked me if I went to the Ascot and I said no. And that's basically the, the reason why, you know, it's it's not it's not at all a classful thing. It's it's just a bunch of like nouveau riche lark about uh day trippers and foreigners that show up either because they've invested like millions in the event or because they want to just hot hobnob with business contacts or because they've got money in a horse or something or because they're just out for a lark as i said and well, and they will just show up and do the sort of things that, that AA uh, uh, said they do it's hot yeah. right uh people are dressed up they start drinking like literally the minute they get in by lunchtime they are absolutely legless um absolutely legless and uh i couldn't believe it i just couldn't believe the behavior i saw at Royal Ascot. it was just um well, there you go Someone yeah. in chat's asking for the ashes of Ascot. I think that's a great. That'd be a great specialist. That would be episode. a good idea. I mean, it's it's it is really quite sad. These these sorts of things. Um, you know, it's uh, it's nothing like it used Although to be. Although it was, it I, I do seem to remember now. Now that we mentioned it, it was kind of segregated as well. Though there were certain areas where the trucks weren't allowed in, essentially. So they were kind of. Uh, mm. There were, I think there was difference in pricing with the different areas, and there were some areas which, which, which were like kind of the VIP only type thing. Um, and uh, in fact, I was I was posted to one of those areas um, because there was like a like a seafood bar or something. I can't remember. I remember now. Um, hmm. I have to say, even in those areas, the behaviour was not that great. Um, no. Okay. Um- I I'd just like to point out as well, just as an, an aside, uh, on the just a note on the women. Um, like the, it's just it's always curious to me and I'm not saying anything about it but it's curious to me that women at this time would have put so much effort into uh, getting into those outfits you know tying up their waists and corsets and you know going to a lot of effort and I feel like women nowadays go to say similar amounts of effort but on totally trivial things you know like they'll spend huge amounts of time and money on like their nails or having like lip injections or some sort of like ghastly tan job. Uh, and yet they'll just be sort of, you know, uh, uh, sort of flabby looking and, and unmolded everywhere else, you know, uh, but particularly in the UK, I think um, there's just this general uh, uh, decline of effort in clothing that we can see if we look at this photograph compared to now say, um, but I think it's most, it's, it's most harshly seen in how women look. Yeah, I mean, there is a there is a particularly bad look that have been that's been around for the past few years of um, of just way way too much makeup. I don't know why yeah. when that became a thing, but uh, you know, I, it, I, you occasionally see those shows um, uh, on like ITV or whatever else. Um, you know, the the fake uh, eyelashes, the way 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 too much makeup, um, and the kind of pouty lips and the lip gloss that they put on now yeah uh you know i don't like that look very much um no don't know where it comes from the ghetto probably i imagine Uh, i imagine um and there's also a sort of like sexual market to it i think you know the so-called sexual liberation of women apparently which looks to me more like a sort of sexual slavery um but you know so do you want to start looking at the decades, uh, Pharaoh? I didn't yeah, yeah, we can probably skip through the Victorian stuff pretty quickly. I mean, like, this is just a quick a flyby up to the to the fifties, just to give you a bit of a 
Um, okay, oh, yes. so it's Victoria. Is, is oh, it's your, it's, your, it's your friend there, Farrah. Uh, I <laughs> yeah, see in the middle. I, I had to Ruskin face, I'm afraid. That's, that's Mr. That's, Ruskin. Um, that's actually Rossetti on the right hand side as well, next to him. Rossetti oh. does not age does not age very well, um, right. unfortunately. But again, that that it's it's quite hard to find very good Victorian um, photos, basically. But uh, yeah. can I can I ask Vera, have you included one um, Gilbert Keith Chesterton uh, in any of these pictures? <laughs> no, I, sh- I should have done actually. Yes, that would be good. Cause right. Again, that's a great example of like uh, you know man- managing your weight with your clothes. You know. Yes. His his poor tailor, you know. <laughs> so uh, okay, what we're we looking at? There's the cane. There's a cane. Is that or yeah. is that? Yeah, that, that's uh, just a walking cane. Which uh, I'm very sad that walking canes went away. Um, I mean, I have a, some canes that I inherited from my late uncle um, that I take out when I'm walking in the country because a lot of the time out there you do need you literally do need a cane and. If people are walking around, then they'll use those like modern um, sort of uh, hiking sticks. But you know, at the end of the day, a, 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 a cane is a cane. You know, it's a stick, so it Doesn't works it, just as well. Didn't Mr. D and, uh, say he walks with a cane? Pretty much. Yes, Mr. D said he, he walks with a cane. He does, uh, but it's. I think for him, it's a necessity um, as opposed to you know, uh, just just an aesthetic thing. With, with, with oh, the canes, yeah. they, were, they were originally used as well to protect against uh, footpads and uh, bandits, and so you would That's literally right. have uh, like people being clubbed to death by uh, cane wielding toffs. That's that's correct. It was a uh, yeah. If you attack somebody with a cane, they had the full right to just hit hit you back with it. You know. Um, also, well, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just reminded of um, of, a, of, a, of a Bob did online. Um, you know, the, the grandfather-in-law's cane turns into a sword. What about the sword cane? This, I don't think um, they, were, they were not that popular, really, but it was. it is a thing. No. Um, the most famous case I can think of is the aforementioned Chesterton. Um, he carried a sword cane his entire life, basically, as a bit of, a, as a bit of fun, because he just, he just thought it was funny to do that. Um, the, really, they're more of like a sort of romantic uh, uh, novel thing. They weren't really a, a, a major piece of of, cl- of of kit. And I mean, um, some so something to note as well is that prior to, I'd probably say sometime between the wars, most streets in England, even in sort of well-to-do areas, would be pretty filthy. You know, whether it was like muck or sewage or uh, there'd be an a, a, a awful amount of horse dung lying around. Um, and all sorts of waste, and there might be people lying across the pavement or whatever. So um, a cane was also very practical, as was sort of like a, a good pair of boots, um, you know, to sort of navigate your way through through streets, especially if you lived in town. Um, that was basically... Through, you know, it was, through the countryside as well. Like if you indeed, see, yeah. like a hardy, you know, t- Tess walking through the countryside with her boots is a classic uh, mm. example. This is. Uh, I, I think to... this is the front cover, wasn't it? I yeah, I managed, I managed to find these. These are basically like adverts of different uh, styles, and I would say that the <laughs> the the body shapes of these men are very, very strange. But it it does show how they're trying to <laughs> emphasize certain parts here. So you can see the slim waist, the broad shoulders, and um, like a, I'd say a medium fit on the the trousers as well. So you do you do, do you keep it a close eye. Also, look at the guy on the right boat uh, bow tie there again, where where it's that's like Works. halfway between between like a cravat and a uh, like a Victorian cravat and a bow tie so you can see how it's evolved out of that style I see him as an artist or a painter for some reason I I, I don't know why I think it's the combination of the red bow and the like straw hat I, I think if, yeah. if, Mr. If, if Mr. D was around in this period he would look <laughs> like that let's, uh, let's carry on um, it, it's just struck me by the way how much of the casualization that we've been talking about was the impact of America and Americanization after the war? I'd say oh. most of it, uh, really. I mean, like America, like especially after the war, where they had these enormous clothing industries, you know, just pr- producing like cheap, comfy fit, like shirts and like overalls and you know what, whatever, just in the millions. Then you know, there's 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 no economic reason to keep your like grandfather's like the, the inherited like suit you got from your grandfather that's been like tailored to you you know um 
also i think there was just a general trend of like uh they wanted to sort of break with the past um in their own sort mm. of way they, they wanted to um create this new era where people dress casually and you know we're sort of looking forward to the future we don't we don't want any of this like victorian stuffiness around anymore that that was a big part of it too uh you know, so it's basically a, a, a combination of cost and fashion. Uh, that... But but conversely, if if you think from from literally like eighteen eighteen twenties to nineteen fifty, the suit hasn't changed that much. You know, no. 100, 130 odd years. So again, I think that does show really the impact of the Second World War that within ten years between whatever uh, like after the war to uh, up into the sixties, there is like a massive change and casualization in men's clothes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, move forward. This is uh, Victorian Mr. D. <laughs> <laughs> the chap there on the left go. looks a bit like a young. Um, what's his name? The uh, the guy that played Doctor Who in the seventies. Um, you know, with the scarf. Uh, what's his name? Oh, I know the one. I'm Tom, Tom Baker. Baker, that's it. Yeah, yeah, he looks a bit like a young Tom Baker. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a very strange. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why, but ever since you, uh, ever since you mentioned the cane thing, I'm picturing the Mister D is like Andre the Giant. It means kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it's five fifteen, five uh, maybe size fifteen shoes. Um, I'm just um, okay. Let's carry on. Um, that's a Chad pose, though. That chap on the right head. Yeah, yeah, very Chad. Uh, very Chad. Okay. Coats. Well, one thing I think. One thing, yeah. One thing I think we miss is these kind of gigantic, uh, fur fur lined um, overcoats. You know, mm. I always think of some, someone like um, the German entrepreneur slash uh, archaeologist Schliemann, who was famous for wearing this kind of very very thick, um, you know, fur coat. Um, and again, in, in the in the time where there's literally no heating whatsoever, it's you know going to keep you very very warm in the cold. So. Yes, I mean, as Ferris said, these things are enormously practical. You you need a big coat, especially if you live in a country like England. Um, and um, in fact, a random anecdote about coats that you know that sort of style you see of men wearing a coat over their shoulders but not having their arms through through the sleeves. Uh, I imagine mm -hmm. you, I imagine you know about that. Eh? I mean, that actually started because wearing an overcoat was considered to be part of your clothing um, in the Victorian period. And men in countries like Spain and Italy um, found it was simply too hot to have the overcoat sort of on pr properly. But at the same time, they didn't want to look uh, slovenly. So they just draped it over their shoulders. Um, that's where it comes from. Um, wow. that's, but that's, that's how accepted the, the fashion was, that you had, an, you had a coat over your suit. So we'll uh, carry on here. So, so this is the first, yeah, Edwardian now, so... But, but I, like like, I think show. I think the Ed 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 Edwardian period is kind of like where the modern idea in our heads of the suit is formed, where again it's more of a straight cut in terms of the suit, so there's less uh, cutting in at, at the waist. The the length as well in Victorian times tend to be below the waist as well. If you if you go back and check through some of the coats and uh, suits, while it's just below the waist on the Edwardian fit, um, mm -hmm. so so it's um, again much more like what we consider to be a suit today. Yeah, much more. And um, I'm not, I don't consider this to be a step down in suit fashion. I consider this to be just a, 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 just a sort of change of style. Um, I'm quite, quite a fan of this look. More Edwardian answer. dress. I like the pinstripes. Um, isn't isn't sorry, this kind but... of how uh, Jacob Rees Mogg uh, dresses? Uh... No, I mean no. not necessarily this one, but what period is, does he hark back? Nineteen ninety-five. That's what he harks back to. <laughs> um, he he just wears a, a double-breasted suit. That's all he wears. I yeah. I refuse to to countenance him as as any part of this. Uh, he's he's a faker. Uh, now something to note here that the you can sort of see it with the man, the, the two men on the left and the one on the right. There, they're all wearing a three-piece suit, but the waistcoat is a different color. Um, mm -hmm. Now. People looking into um, wearing uh, sort of suits more often should look into having to doing this to to wearing a suit with a waistcoat that doesn't match, but but the colours work together basically because um, 
it, it's it's it it gives it a more casual air. I think if you just wear a three piece suit with a similar pattern casually, it doesn't work. It, that that sort of thing is when you're you know in an office or doing something particular or you're at an event like a funeral, say, where you want to look sort of uh, as neat as you can. I think the, the this this is what to aim for if you want to look sort of uh, smart and also not stuffy. You know, mix mix and match your suits. I mean, I'm I'm quite a fan of having like uh, sort of light tan beige trousers with a brown jacket and either a light blue or a kind of uh, off off blue or or perhaps even like sort of light cream waistcoat or just any waistcoat really works for that combination. Um, you know, it's, it's just, a, you've, you've got to kind of flip through and find what, what works, what looks, looks good on you and what works. And, you know, it's, it's not very hard to learn how clothing colors work. It's, it's, it's quite simple, really. The cane very in at this point as well. So. Uh, absolutely ubiquitous. Yeah. More of these Edwardians. We can just mm -hmm. skip through. Uh, I would note, by the way, um, just on that guy on the right, the uh, grey striped trousers. Um, my uh, great grandfather, um, who lived in, I think you might know it, a um, Ebervale in in the in the, yeah. in the in the Welsh valleys. Um, yeah. He he had a what he called his parliamentaries, um, which was basically a uh, the sort of uh gray striped trousers a morning coat like that and a black waistcoat um which he used to wear to go to the uh he he was uh although i suppose it was less pos then he was a member of the conservative party and he used to go to the conservative club in Ebervale on the on on the weekend in his parliamentaries um as did most of the men that were in it um and in fact there's a very good picture of ronald reagan meeting the emperor of japan uh, and they're all wearing that style of morning dress that what what my what my great grandfather called parliamentaries. Um, cool. It's a it's quite a good picture. Why why have they got such tiny feet? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the style of the drawing, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay uh, here are some other traps from the Edwardian era. He's another Ooh. he's another more portly fellow. Yeah, I mean, he looks a bit ch Chestonian, doesn't he? He, he, I see. There's, I think, when you have a suit that's tailored to fit you like that, even if you're portly, it has a kind of like portly, like dad energy to it. Like, he, he, like, look at the way he's like, he's stood as well. You know, that's the that's a pretty Chad looking guy, even though he's quite big. We'll carry on We're moving into the 1920s. I can't zoom this one in for some reason. Uh, oh, sorry, I can see. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's not a huge, huge amount of change. No, I think there is. That's, there's like, more... sorry, sorry. Uh, hang on, a go, go, go back one. Yep. Sorry, Farragon. Um. No, yeah, yeah. I was just saying that there wasn't a huge amount of change. Maybe a few, a few more bow ties. Um. um at this point, I would, I would say, right for for a start, that man on the right is is Mr. D. That's Mr. D's ancestor right there. Like you know. <laughs> This man, so, this so, man or this, man or this no, man. The, the, the man that's so tall his head isn't in the frame and he leans <laughs> on the cane. That's exactly how I imagine that Mr. D like stands in real life when he's sort of like just stood idle somewhere. That's that's what I imagine he looks like. Um and uh yeah, that you know, there's um one one thing to note is that far more men by the twenties have pocket watches, um, which which were kind of a like for example, you'll you'll notice that as more men sort of move into industry or they move up into the middle class they have to have a watch on them constantly they have to know exactly what time it is to get where they need to be on time which you don't really see before um where it's it's like everybody sort of wakes up at one time and then goes off to uh wherever wherever they need to be that you know now there's a, a a big need for 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 watches to be a thing um and you have to remember that watch mechanisms then were very expensive um i i would i always equivalent i always make it an equivalent of like uh like i'd say probably for the cost of what you'd get like a a, a smartphone for now you can get a watch or, or an alarm clock for then because and of course that that isn't like un unaffordable for most people you know you'll still be able to get one but it's sort of something you have to keep treasured you know it's a it's a it's quite it's quite a luxury item that you that, that but it's still very important so that's what i could that's what i make the equivalent equivalent to i found some uh Actual, actual real life uh, pictures of John D. By the way, 
Um, do you want to have a look? <laughs> Go, Go on. on. So uh, here he is. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, he's not that tall. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, so... that's 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 uh, that's him and me then. Uh... <laughs> Let's carry on. Um, uh, okay. So let's uh, have a look at these fashions. Very smart. Yeah, well, one thing I'll say about the 20s is that there's kind of like a move to lighter suits again because mm. of the um, elite obsession with uh, international travel at this period. So again, you've got things like um, the Orient Express and uh, air travel starting to open up and obviously kind of uh, cruises the need for kind of a lighter a lighter suit so you know so using cotton instead of wool um linen, linen suits and then also lighter colors to kind of reflect the light um so you tend to see kind of more whites and creams at this period um but the cut stays i, I mean i mean maybe it's a bit more blocky i'd say in the in the in the 20s you know it's, it's kind of like the, the, these guys are clearly very thin and they've got quite a wide um suit, suit on them still the last um, last holiday I took to was to uh, Spain, and uh, I I dressed most of the time like that chap on the right uh, because it, it it's it's uh, it looks nice in in nice weather and it's not too hot. Um, and I mean, I'd say that look is pretty timeless. This I I think the twenties and the thirties I think reached the peak of men's fashion in a sense, and it's never been the same since because. Um, I mean, the Edwardian period, even though it looks very smart, um, it, almost every suit was black. It was either black or had grey trousers. I think partially because when it, it was something to do with the late a, a late Victorian period that brought in this ubiquitous black colour in men's suits that just went on till the First World War, essentially. Um, and then twenties, the twenties and thirties made things colourful again. And you know, I'm a, I'm a more of a fan of colour than I am of black suits. I, in fact, I don't actually own a uh, black suit. I have ones that are very dark navy for funerals or particularly solemn events. But like pitch black uh, isn't a particularly good colour uh, for a man's suit. I mean, th there's something, um, there's something about this that makes me think, you know, our oh, man in Havana or whatever. <laughs> yes, you know, it's it's a it's a Chad yeah. look, I think. And and yeah, because again, I think they they would be. You know, taking taking a cruise to the Bahamas or whatever. You know, that, that's when it starts to happen, really. More twenty stuff. Yeah, this is this is, I think some American styles. So again, they they go for the kind of super tucked in waist. It can, it kind of reminds me of like early Hollywood or something like that. The guy on the top left, or or like mm -hmm. going golfing or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's literally wearing his uh, you know golf caddy. So. A tiny yeah. spot, tiny spot of gangsterism in there. Tiny spot. There is a little bit, isn't there? <laughs> uh, especially the man in the middle with the pinstripe yeah. suit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, there's something to note about uh, the hats they're wearing. You see how three of them have those uh, round, flat-topped straw boater hats. Now, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a shame that those aren't really prat. They aren't. They aren't really wearable now because they're so. Yeah. They're so parodied that you would just yeah. look silly even, you know even if by our standards you, you'd look good it would just look silly so um it's a shame they went away because i had to uh, i had to wear a very similar style of hat at school and they're very good in uh in 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 sun very practical very comfortable hats and there was actually a code in america that that that, that said that you couldn't wear a straw hat before may day i think it was um and then there was a particular day in September where you had to switch back to wearing like a felt hat or sort of, you know, like a Homburg or a Trilby. And there was a tradition where young men would go around after May Day and anybody who was wearing a straw hat would have it taken off them, smashed up. And then and then and then they would they would get like beaten up. Um, and there was actually a massive riot. in I think New York or sh Chicago called the straw hat riot where people literally died. Because people were fighting over these straw hats. Amazing. Uh, yeah, that's, that's how serious they took it. That's a, that's a society of standards, right there. Basically, you're willing to die for your hat. That is a that is a <laughs> strong society. This is a decent thing to riot over. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's carry on. <laughs> um, so here's uh, here's more 1920s. Oh, yeah. yeah, this this is kind of some modern interpretations. But again, you see, you kind of get the use of creams again, even in the shoes as well. And also, you've got basically the first kind of casual um, shoes coming in. 
sports becoming increasingly popular, like uh, cricket and um, mm -hmm. and tennis, and so you'd have kind of uh, t like. It, it, isn't this a bit that. kind of gondola? This one. Um, is kind of... It's like a it's like a regatta blazer, isn't it? So maybe if you're I would, boating or. I have two of those sorts of blazers, but I wouldn't wear them with trousers that white. I would pair them with greys or light tans. Um, because the the sh it, it is a bit too costumey, you know. The, the the thing is about about n about nowadays is that if you want to look good in this style of sort of vintage fashion, you have to draw a very fine line between parody and LARP and actually looking quite fresh. Um, so, uh, basically, yeah, watch out for that if you're thinking of going anywhere near this. Um, the 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 two tone shoes that you see on the left there and on the and on the right actually. Um, Again, they're very bold, and I would say generally avoid them. You know, um, they they they're very hard to get looking. You know, tasteful. They they always look a bit sort of clowny. I think on a lot of people, myself included. Um, um, I think the white suit is good, and it's something you that you can still wear now. Um, it's also very comfortable in the heat. If you wanna if you wanna wear a suit in hot weather, get get yourself a white linen suit. It's yeah. wonderful. You look very smart and it's and it's comfortable. I tell you who's a big wearer of, of, of the white suit is uh, Puff Daddy, of course. He, he loved a white uh, suit. I'm afraid I don't know him. Um, linen is good, but it's um, very tricky to deal with as well. So just be be warned. Um, it's not a lot of not, not forgiving material is what I'm saying. Uh, a lot of people would crucify me for this, but I'm of the opinion that you basically your linen suit is going to get crumpled because it's linen. So like, don't even try to iron it unless it's like super crumpled. Um, like mm. linen, linen looks fine if it's a bit crumpled. I think, especially like men's linen suits. You, you don't want it. You don't want it to look like you just walked out of a like a, a sort of fashion shoot. You you want it to look a bit worn. You want it to look crumpled. You like if you if you really want to pull off like tough energy. You want to make it look like you just dragged it out of the cupboard and sort of like put it on and you're just wearing it. You know, don't don't preen it too much. Make make sure that it looks like you could have inherited it from your father, basically. Let, let me just show you Puff Daddy Panama hat because I, I think it might be fun to gauge your reactions of his uh... Puff Daddy. Yeah, right, have a look in the there he is. When you Welcome when you his... first said it, I, I I thought you said Puff Daddy, and I was a bit confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh well he goes he, he's known as P Diddy these days, but there, right, there he is, okay. but See him um, in his white suit. I it's a bit small. Uh, the image. Uh, you can, well, I can. He looks like kind up. of like a like a sort of black pimp from 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 the seventies. A bit there. Yeah. I see. The the thing is, it's not awful. Like it's 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 a bit tacky that first one. But these other suits he's wearing are not. But that that I wouldn't. This now that is actually that if if he wore maybe a a, a different colored tie. That white, that white suit with the pinstripes would be beautiful. That's a, I, I, for years now, I wanted to get a white suit with like champagne-y uh, pinstripes on it, and like if if he just spruced that up slightly more, he would look very good in it. But you know, he's a African American rapper, so you know he'll he'll wear whatever he feels like, I suppose. There he is. Okay, but he's, he not, does... he's not terrible. He's not. He he. You know, this is this is not bad and i suppose i presume he has the money to uh to have all his suits tailored if he's you know yeah he is with his minion he's got he's got there's mace, his <laughs> minion mace. Well, that, that's, a, that's a bit strange uh, uh but, but but yeah i mean he he's known for rocking the white suit it, uh, yeah there, there he is look as a i get big, again big, if it uh, these these aren't bad places to start if they're, they're, they're a bit preeny they're a bit they're a bit sort of nouveau riche they they do need work but like again, this, this is this is me talking from like a sort of trad Brit standpoint. So you know, it, it, he's he's not a badly dressed man. Let's put it that way. You know, in 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 the age that we currently live in, uh, I'm not going to really have a go at this. You know, given what most people look like. I mean that that chap stood ne next to him in that last picture you showed was wearing a a black suit with a black shirt and a black tie, which I hate. So many people do it; it looks awful. Don't don't ever wear that. It's so, not a good look. So yeah, in fact, I'll show you one last one. I found because uh, this is this was his kind of basic look for a long time. There you go. Just uh, I I I like that. Spine, I would maybe yeah. I would maybe make make the collar a bit narrower. But other than that, that's actually a very nice suit. Um, it's tasteful. It's it's tailored to him. That's I I applaud that suit. That's very well done. All right. So let's get back to the. 
Uh, it's very hot in here. I don't know. You should take your waistcoat off. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, here we go. This is the uh, 30s now. So, so uh, like 30s, 30s trends tend to be a little bit uh, e even bigger than the, the 20s. And basically, the suits get wider and wider at this point, uh, where you start to get some very overly sized suits, particularly in America. So, um, but again, you know, I think some, and, and also, I think there's quite uh, some, the waist gets even higher. So you can see the chap on the right hand side. The waists are already substantially higher than we have today, on average, um, from every time we've seen, but spe specifically the 30s is even higher than that. Um, okay. Yes, uh, Pharaoh is uh, Pharaoh is right about that, and um, there was also something of a reaction to the depression. Um, like you'll notice that these are a lot more sort of conservative in how they look, and the waistcoats are the same color as the suits, and they're quite thinly cut, uh, especially the, especially the sort of the upper parts of them. Um, so yeah, there's there's also that. I mean, again, twenties and the thirties, I'm a really big fan of, and and these are still suits you can wear today and no one would even sort of think you were trying to larp or anything you know it, these are very classy very well tailored suits that again if people are interested in, in looking like this sit like e e the thing is even if you don't have the money to to go to a tailor and have a full suit made which if you go to a regional tailor isn't that expensive anyway but if you don't you know get yourself like a sort of sales suit from a respectable high street brand like you mentioned a tm lewin or mm -hmm. like even even Marks and Spencers, the upper range of that will do. You know, get some of those and take them to a tailor and just have the tailor adjust them for you. You know, make just have him do the little tiny things that he will know about that will make these things look like the suits on these chaps here. You know, perfectly fitted, crisp, smart. Make sure that you, you either know how to, to, to keep them pressed and clean or have a laundry service nearby that, that does that. It's not really that hard. Just, you know... And if, if we're going to commit to, I don't know, being something, you know, even if it's just a sort of community of people that have meetups occasionally, you know, I think we should put the effort in at least, you know. So still in the 1930s here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th th this is where kind of American styles tended to uh, become bigger. Uh, and again, the kind of rise of Hollywood and basically the, the Brits starting to copy what Americans look like. So again, the guy on the left is that's a very like the kind of the wide tie. Um, the ties get a lot, lot uh, larger and more patterned during this period as well. And um, what's this? And it, uh, I kind of I kind of like these long. Yeah, coats, it's like a trench coat, Burberry, yeah, or, or, Burberry or trench coat. coats, or a Macintosh cool. or something. Yeah, very they're cool, very nice. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a sort of uh, uh, Casa Blanca look there. Uh, they were huge in the eighties. Those, those. Uh, if you go back to the, have a look at tons of like TV and stuff from the eighties. They were ubiquitous for a period. Those. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. those so the eighties ones would tend to be oversized with very like wide shoulders they, again. They tend to be more baggy. More so, yeah, more that's baggy. Right. Yeah. In fact, there's a, there's a there's a good example of that in that uh, famously hilarious uh, Mick Jagger and David Bowie video from um, from Live Aid. I forget what they. But you could Bowie's wearing a ridiculously baggy one in that. Uh, anyway, Those, I, 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 I think that's a good look. And again, you know, it's it's slightly more unusual now, and it it, and it has sort of connections to various uh, stock characters and stuff from films. But if you do it right, you'll look good in that. Um, and I like his hat as well. Very good. More thirties action. Yeah, this this is you sort of had like a a really weird fashion trend for these kind of three quarter length baggy trousers again, especially for kind of golf. And again, you, if you see any kind of like um, Hollywood directors of the time would sort of go around wearing these as well. But I don't know where they come from. You know, maybe it's a riding thing. Now, now this this sort of wear is very much what um, Dick Ward, uh, you know, Bruce Wayne's. Uh, uh, not Dick Ward, what's his name? Dick Grayson. Um, you know, Robin from Batman and Robin. Mm. In in uh when he's not Robin, this is the sort of stuff uh, you see Robin knocking around in uh, when he's mm -hmm. Dick Grayson, uh you know, well in the earlier comics anyway. So Yeah. Um I think that this is very of its time, to be honest with you. Um I'm not like I personally wouldn't 
dressed like this. Uh, it's a bit, as I said, it's it's of a very particular time, and it's I don't know. It it, it was it was of a movement of young men that like to wear these sorts of clothes, and you, you can see that they're wearing. They're not wearing full trousers. They're wearing uh, breeches with uh, uh, plus four socks. Again, you know. These are sort of very interesting period pieces, but they're not really applicable now. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Unfortunately, I have spotted dishonest chin on this chap here. Yeah, they do look a bit dysgenic, don't they, <laughs> these chaps? Okay, let's carry on. All right, here we go. 1930 to 1939. Yeah, I, I just put in this as it's kind of like a bit of a broader straight, but we can maybe we can go through that. We've sort of seen most things in here so mm -hmm. um is that barack obama 1938 <laughs> he does have an obama smile doesn't he Looks a very <laughs> like obama or indeed um huey long uh the southern politician the populist um there's a lot of very good pictures of him wearing white suits in new orleans where he was uh the the infamous uh, i think he was the governor and then he became as a senator for that state uh very good pictures of him dressed like that uh, my god he's a spitting image of Barack Obama anyway let's, <laughs> let's carry on um, yeah uh, I think we've yeah. said we've talked about these really <laughs> <laughs> so I had to put the, the zoot suit oh, in here oh no and this, this is literally this? This, this is after the second second world war the kind of the rise of this massively oversized suit it, it was a very brief suit suit. Uh, it, it, it was a very brief thing. I mean, you, and you, you, you can see why. I mean, it was it was essentially after the war in America, they had tons of fabric free that they didn't have during the war. So they just put them into these absurd looking suits. I, 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 I you know, if, if you've ever seen um, Jim Carrey's Jim Carrey in the film, The Mask, uh, he, ha he has a zoot suit in that. You know, it's it's ridiculous looking baggy suits, basically. Uh, oh, also, um, the Zoot Suit riot, because I, I mentioned the Straw Hat riot. Um, the, a bunch of Americans rioted about Mexican immigrants wearing Zoot Suits during the war um, <laughs> because uh, the Mexicans were, like, sort of not really going by the accepted American credo of, you know, being conservative during the war, you know, of uh, supporting the war effort by keeping your clothing materials sort of uh, minimal. Um, the Mexicans started to wear these sorts of suits, and a bunch of American youths went 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 got very angry, and uh, pe people died <laughs> quite badly. Wow. Okay. Uh... Um, no, and, and, I mean, yeah. Sorry. This is this looks like the sort of wear that they would make people wear in a all women's prison. This guy on the right. <laughs> yeah. It's in not, a prison it's not cell block here. Yeah, like it's it's the it's the shirts where there's been more change. Where again, look, this is the first time we've not seen chaps wear ties at all. And again, it's that casual Amer American style, um, you know, almost like um, that they could be in a, like Hawaii or something like that. It's like a Hawaiian collar or whatever. But it's just mm. it's just interesting. This is the first picture we've seen without the tie. They've got American the faces. Something in yeah. their faces that looks American to me. Don't know why you can just tell. Sometimes you can tell he's an, Amer an American. Um, yeah, it's more. I mean, this is a bad era. This one, I don't like this. <laughs> Look is at this the middle. like Teddy Boys. <laughs> no, they're they're, they're that, that's kind of like fifties, um, really. But it's the start. It comes out of this. I can uh, see uh, a young uh, Ronald Reagan wearing that sort of. Yeah, thing. yeah. definitely. Uh, again, look, I'm not a fan. No, no tie in the middle. The, the, these are unfitted, oversized, on purpose. The, there's a very wide the fit on, yeah, wide fit on the trousers as well, and also the colours. They sort of go a little bit crazy. Where again, again, look at the 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 shirt colour of the guy in the middle, or the the blue, the light blue suit of the guy on the left hand side. What's kind of interesting looking at these is that um, George Sanders, of course, who's uh, you know my famous thing, my avatar, um, in a lot of his appearances, he seems like he was wearing like 1930s style fashions in the 40s and the 50s. Yeah. He certainly wasn't wearing these sorts of clothes. It was it was much more formal uh, attire. Um, Again, the, uh, it's 
quite quite sad thing is that of course you can see in this picture it's tending towards workwear now you know these these are what they're wearing to go to the office you know these are sort of you know as we said ubiquitous off the peg suits uh this this, this is the beginning of the end really it's it's it's, it's all downhill Somebody's saying, I kind of wish A would have brought on a YouTuber who actually knows about gentlemen's fashions. Well, I mean, don't you know about gentlemen's fashions? Why, 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 why is he uh, sniping from the side here? Is um, I think it's possible he wants somebody that's like uh, into all of the different styles, so he can tell you about like the specifics of like say this one. I mean, I, I suppose that's what he means. So let's uh, let's carry on. Uh... Oh, here we go. Right down the right down the whole decade. Yeah, but, but again, I, I think my summary for the forties is just general, general ca uh, casualization, especially it's after American. The, all just look at American. And, and again, that's it. Like uh, it's interesting because the 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 fashion flows from Britain to America in the tens and twenties, where you've got things like the uh, mid Atlantic drawl, you know, where basically loads of Americans larp as British people on mm. in right, yeah. Um, and and so the kind of cultural power is still in Britain, but by the second second world war it flips over. There's something about these that make me think, you know, they could be trying to sell me something like this guy here, or yeah, they're a bit okay. spivvy, aren't they? Um, these are so again, you have the uh, highly padded shoulders, the sort of trimmed waist, and the trousers are in what's called a drape cut. Um, that was actually, or at least the ones in the top row are, that were popularized by, of all people, um, King Edward VIII um, when he was a young man. He was basically a kind of, like, big fashion icon. Like, there's tons of pictures of him wearing all these, like, extremely dandyish outfits uh, when he was the Prince of Wales. And he had a tailor make him these drape-cut trousers that then became a sort of very popular fashion. Uh, but I believe he was the first one to do them. So let's uh, carry on. There's the zoot suits again. That's like that's a live zoot. But can you see they're, they're just they're, they're literally aren't, they're not like parachutes on the trousers, but they also like tuck in really tight, <laughs> tightly at the ankles. It's so bad. He looks I like, I, as well. Are they, is this an American this, mod? This is in America. Yeah. This picture. I mean that that I I I just love that officer in the middle there, just utterly, just like unable to comprehend what he's looking at. And uh, I think we've reached the end. Okay, um, is that it, Farrow? Yeah, that's it. The kind of his, historical stuff. So then, I've I've also got just kind of like a, a if you go to the, the main folder, just a couple of different types of uh, items within the the area. And then I thought, get your thoughts on <laughs> different different uh, types. Well, yeah, we'll have to be pretty quick here. Um, I mean, maybe uh, let's just have a okay. Let's have a whip through hats. Yeah. Yes, so there's a so there's a there's, these are two fedoras, uh, flat cap. Pretty... <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was quite a good photo of them. He, he should have kept that beard. beard. He should have kept that beard. Yeah. The pork pie. Uh, the pork pie is controversial, mm -hmm. and then the trilby is obviously terrible. The pork pie always reminds me of uh, George Galloway when he appears on TV. He, <laughs> he, he always wear wears pie? a. He, he wears that exact one, I think. Uh, these are a bit. Uh, I've, I've got know. a cap like that that I wear occasionally. Yeah, no, yeah. Nice. Th those, nice. those, those ones will always work if you if you do them right. Those aren't really a problem. They, it's the fedoras, the trilbies, uh, and all these sorts of things. These, like, the the trouble is the what the, the, if you just wear it like that, you will always have this like slightly weird, like London hipstery look. Um, you need to pair it well, and you need to make sure that it's not like too outstanding it needs to it needs to be such a part of the clothes you're wearing that it doesn't come off as being a statement or you trying to look a certain way i would generally recommend for people who are looking to get into formal fashion to not start with hats leave leave hats out of it for a bit get get your suits and blazers and trousers looking good before you start thinking about hats um because it, it always just airs to larpiness uh unless you know what you're doing okay Let's uh, quickly go on to outerwear, what you've called. Uh, you're talking about jackets and things like that. Yes, I've, I've just got like every single uh, of the kind of major men's cuts here, but they're not, they're not all formal, so I don't know if uh, Panama will approve 
Uh, there's oh, no, no. Um, I, I have a, a couple of barber things like that because they're very practical the for going outdoors. Yeah, <laughs> duffel coat. The, the, the fleece is very cursed. I had to put this in here just for all but the no, lovely, cozy fleece wearers. This, but the, the, the fleece had a very big uh, period in the mid-90s. People were very into fleeces for some reason. No, uh, I, don't, I don't think I've ever, I've ever owned a fleece. Like, I, it, it's not that I have a problem with them. I, I've just never, like, considered having one. I've got one. I've got one from Jack Will. I've got loads of stuff from Jack Wills because um, there's, there's something about it that um, there's a certain size in Jack Wills that just fits me. So Mrs. A just keeps on getting... Because she knows it fits, she keeps on getting me stuff from Jack Wills. Uh, so, uh, mm. But I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a fleece I wear occasionally uh, in navy blue. Um, yeah. The cursed gilet. I hate gilets. That's what... Do you I'm hate them? Fan. Just either wear, know. either wear, either wear an out, out or either wear a full, a full coat, or not. This is some kind of cursed, <laughs> cursed middle ground. No, no I, the... I have to admit, I, I have a gilet, and I, I, so I have, I have been known to go out with a gilet in that cap occasionally. <laughs> all the farmers, all the farmers around here wear them. They literally like they, they will wear what this guy is wearing. They'll, they'll wear like. Like black jeans or like work trousers with that style style of shirt, that style of gilet, and that style of cap. So, I'm sorry, I, I don't know, Farrah. I, I would I would say sort of country country wear is is, is very strange because I've been to like a few country fairs where people sort of dress up, and it's kind of like another world to me. Where again, they've all got kind of their own separate rules, and there is again like hierarchy and hierarchy through tweed. Basically, that people can recognise yeah. the different qualities of tweed while you know being a degenerate m- metropolitan dweller you just don't this is, get that as much no I, I would point out that that i would consider it a breach of rules to wear this in london say AA, or you know in in a town or <laughs> city <laughs> a, 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 well, you know the, I, I, i'll have breached those rules many times <laughs> there you go then <laughs> you know. it's uh, also it's very medieval this style of clothing uh this is something that goes back as far as there've been you know men w- walking around i think uh, in clothes that style of Clothing. Oh dear! What is what is this, this is great, doing? This is, this is a, great, a great coat. The, the military is interesting because again, it was, there was a fad for it, you know, twenty years ago. Yeah. But again, I think it's, it's something that hasn't aged well. And, what is he uh, doing? Is he wearing trainers and jeans with that? Yeah. Like I, they, they can be good. I think if you can get a good, a good, uh, a good great coat. Is this the Parker? The, the cursed this? Parker. That was the um, uh, bigger. That was also big in the nineties with Oasis, of course. Mm. Um, it's quite a nice one. Um, I, I see. I imagine this this being sort of you as like a young professor, AA, uh, almost like. I did. I, have, I did have. A, I did have a coat like that at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, I was. I was very into collars. Like put my collar up like that. A little wanker. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 not bad. I I I'd say that if you want to wear like, I I call it like casual formal wear. Start with uh, start with something like this. You know, I, this I'd is, never this wear is those. Good look. I hate the skinny trousers. I'd never wear those. No, you know. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, cool, cool, cool to jacket again. I think it's another countryside like only. It. Very genteel that style of jacket. I like it. I put this in for you. This is this is a sh- uh, shearling, so you've got the kind of like the sheep lined. But I thought it had the kind of derelict vibes that you may like. AA. <laughs> he looks like a coat. Like, uh, is that Gosling? Yes, what, what Gosling that? from uh, from Blade Runner too. Long coats are always good. Uh, try to avoid looking like a, a Forbidden Planet nerd, but you know, don't don't get like a sort of black gothy one. But get get yourself a long coat. It'll look good, I'll, and it's very I'll practical. Never, I'll never forget the group of nerds uh, when I was about seventeen or eighteen. They used to walk through town. In their long matrix jackets, you know, <laughs> I was a star for a while. That was terrible, terrible, ridiculous. Avoid um, it. Okay, quite nice. Uh, yeah, I like that. Um, let me just I, again. I've I've never been a fan of skinny trousers. Uh, I, no, I think it's I best to get a wider. It, it, it's yeah. it's too kind of uh, uh, androgynous, I think, and a bit too like uh of of the current moment i think if, because uh, remember the, the aim with with this with what we're doing on this stream or what at least at least what i advise people is 
don't look of your era. You know, don't be like, you don't want to look back at pictures of yourself. Like people look back at pictures of themselves in the seventies now, you know, and be like, Oh God, I, I look so of the era. But at the same time, you don't want to look like you're trying to laugh as a different era. You don't want to just wear like an Edwardian style suit all the time. So you want to look timeless. And I think if this would be timeless, if he just wore a slightly wider cut of trousers, you know, they haven't got to be like z- zoot yeah. suit trousers, but you know, the, sk- the skinny look is a bit 2010s, I think. This is just another, like a wax cotton jacket. But again, that's slightly better than looking fully countryside, I think, so. Okay. Well, I, th- I think we're, ra- we're rapidly running out of time here, so I'm, I may have to uh, pick one. Which one would you... What, what's the most... She, she, uh, she, she's quite good. I think she's as controversial. Okay. What shoes, what shoes do you have? Who me? Okay. Yeah. I've got a lot of... Um, I've got a lot of suede shoes. Uh, but, um, I'm trying to remember what they're called now. Mrs. Mrs. AA got me some uh, shoes from this place. She bought me a pile of them, and they were like each one of them was like three hundred and fifty quid or whatever. Um, and I kept them for years. She bought them all at the same time, and um, I've just been working through them. So I wore the first pair until they basically were falling apart. Now I've moved on to the second pair, and I've got two left. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of that store now. I'll have to look. I'll have to look it up. But it's. Uh, it's uh yeah, it's a it's a brown suede shoe essentially. Yep. Okay. Uh yes, this, this is a Chelsea boot or ankle boot. Um yeah, I, I think it's quite a good uh, versatile shoe. So again, you can get a little bit dirty or you know, it's, it's not like a, a full boot, but it's a bit more a bit more comfy. So it's uh, still quite nice. Um, I'm kind of again, this is going to seem petty, but I'm of the opinion that men should wear lace-ups I, I chelsea boots are un, unless you're going riding then they're really more of a i i, I think they like uh i, I don't know it, it's just a personal thing I, I think they're more of a woman's thing i, I know it's a, it's it's controversial and it's and i know it's sort of uh a lot of people are gonna get very angry about that but uh if, if you're gonna be a man and you want to wear like i i pretty much every day i wear either brown brogues or brown brogue boots and like literally it, they look like these but they have lace instead of those uh stretchy patches yeah, on the no, side. The bro, that's, the, that's the mr man shoe isn't it that was all the mr man wore yeah what yeah I, I i i recommend I, I, there seems to be this trend to go for oxfords when men start to dress properly but i think really what you should do is go for brogues they, they're far more cut co- remember the, the aim is not to be dour and drab the aim is to is to is to look good and also have a bit of color and a bit of spirit about you so i i, I definitely would recommend uh, uh brogues more so than oxford's for most cases unless you unless you're wearing a suit for an office or an event or something formal then you definitely wear sort of smooth oxford's or smooth boots but you know give 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 brogues a chance and if you want to wear boots give brogue boots a chance i think okay let's move on uh So there's the brogue. There's a fine brogue. Uh, I, I tend to go for dark brown laces. Um, those are, those ones are quite tan looking. Uh, that's a fine brogue shoe. Again, this is I, I think this is the perfect blend of kind of pattern and style and also a kind of like minimalist seriousness that men's fashion has to have, I think, you know, and a sort of practicality. These are these sorts of shoes. If you if you if you get proper ones, if you invest in a good pair of brogues or Oxfords or any type of shoe, if it's from a good good supplier, then these will uh then these will last you for years, you know. And you can take them in to have them repaired occasionally depending on how much you wear them. I, I wear mine literally every, every day, so they do tend to wear out fairly quickly. Uh but you know by fairly quickly I mean like once a year. Uh so that's oh, uh, all right. I, I figured out the name of the brand of my uh of my uh, brand suede shoes, by the way, mm-hmm. it's, it's yeah. a make called Russell and Bromley. Yeah, they're quite nice. They're like a mid-range, mid-range yeah. brand, or, or a Loke is a good alter- alternative to that. Uh, um, I, th- I think I found the sort of thing. I don't know if it's exactly these pairs, but it's something like this because I recognise yeah, that a loafer, a suede loafer. Uh, yeah, mm. so I, I wear I wear those quite a lot. 
Nice. Uh, anyway, so let's get back. Uh, here we go. Suede breaks. Um, What's, what, what was your thoughts on, on, on the suede break, uh, Adamar? Um, I've never actually worn suede shoes. I, I've never really got why. Uh, I mean, fun, I mean, I, I literally, I've, I've never worn them. So, I mean, I have to ask: Are they? Are they one? Are they waterproof? Yes. Like they, they, they have to be right. Yeah. Water, um, they're I water mean, resistant. They're water resistant. I'd say as water. Um, waterproof is you totally repel water, but no leather shoe does. And right, then maybe okay. a maybe a patent a patent or a, a boot like a boot would do, but. Um, yeah, they're just as re water resistant as a normal brake. Um, I have no thoughts on them, to be honest with you. I, I mean, I, I, I've never worn one. Um, I think if provided, again, like any of these things, if you play them off tastefully, then I don't see any problem with them. Um, they actually look very comfortable. I may have to invest in a pair now um, and give them a try. That, that also, that has got, um, I think the, the picture of the brogue you posted, the heel was, the, the sole on the heel was very thin and very flat. Um, if you want a proper good pair of shoes or boots, that's the heel and sole you want to have. You know, something really sort of hard and robust with a, with a bit of a heel to it. You'll get, you know, very, very, very comfortable and very sturdy. This is the, the Desert Boot, which again was, was quite popular for, for a while, but I'm not a particular fan. It's kind of like a again. casual, smart casual. This is kind of like your um, so California wearer. Like these, yeah, what, these are just okay, these are silly. <laughs> I love loafers, Panama. This is gonna be a real big rift in our uh, friendship no, right now. No, no, la no, no laces on the loafers. Lace, it, lace them up, lace them up, lace oh them up. Goodness. I'm not slip on loafers like that. It, no, 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 no. I these would, are, I would think monk straps, monk strap shoes. I don't. I, 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 I have, I, ha I had a pair of monk straps, which were very nice, but they're a real faff to. Uh, they're actually harder to to lace up. Or hard to, there to, you to go. Uh, or, sort them it, than, uh, just, 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 just shoes. Shoes shouldn't be this this big of an issue. Just look that. That's what a shoe should look like. That that that's uh, a shoe. No, I've got. If I need to wear a suit, um, I've got a black pair of these basic Oxfords somewhere um, that I wear all the time. Uh, well, I say all the time. If I ever need to wear a pair of shoes, I've got a few pairs of these uh, with with. With laces, oh, you'll be pleased to hear Panama. So that's yeah. very good. I again, you know, I understand that loafers are very popular, but I personally have no truck with them. This yeah. is a uh, patent shoes, so again, this is normally for formal wear, but you can wear them in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Very shiny, uh, shined well, yeah. The tasseled loafer, which is, again is probably right. like. Panama's least favorite shoe. Well, no, well, no. Right, here's here's the thing. So I have a pair of basically slippers that are these, right? But that's what I wear them for. They're slippers. I I I I put them on. I I, I get dressed in the morning, and I put on something like this just to walk around the house. And then when I'm going out, I get into some boots. That's that's like that's what those are for. I I would never wear them out with anything. They they, it's I just I just wouldn't do it. I don't know. It's just it's a personal thing. Yeah, just one thing on loafers, they should always be worn with a sock. That is a real... Oh, uh, right. We're, we're going to agree on this massively. Very, very, very important point. Sorry, go on. What, what, what do you mean to wear, wear with a sock? When would you ever not wear a sock? An, 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 there's, an ankle there's, sock. There's a, trend. There's, a, there's a trend. You can buy these kind of like mini socks, which will go only yeah. up to the edge. What? Again, they are basically women's socks, and uh, people wear them where it looks like you're not wearing any socks with them. You should always wear socks. <laughs> No, no, but but it, it, it. I don't know how you haven't seen it, especially in um, London, AA. London, like it's yeah, it's, it's all over the place. Now that, that right, those are a cracking pair of brogue boots. I swear by those sorts of boots. Um, you know those. You know very very comfortable, very sturdy. Um, I believe there may be some uh, like health benefit to do with how they hold your ankle um, and how you walk. I I don't know about that though. Uh, but but they. You know, I highly recommend anybody who wants a good pair of boots to wear with a suit, get these. These are excellent. Okay, and uh, that's the that's the end then. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at some uh, super chats. Uh, we have uh, unfortunately not got enough time to go into the the ties, the tops, the trousers. Uh, but I think we had a pretty good look at men's fashions. 
I've, I've, I've had some ideas uh, when I finally go out and buy some threads myself. We, we will um, be judging you at the, at the conference. Oh, God. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there. I'll be there in my stiff collar. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's have a look at, uh, at Super Chats and Entropy. Coca-Cola says, uh, through the dark souls of future past, the evil wizard longs to cheese. One chance out between two worlds. Ooh, woo, Mr. D. I yeah, no I, I, I have to sh have to say it, it's a great shame that uh, Mr. D couldn't be here with us. Um, but you know, if knowing him, it'll be something very important that he's trying to sort out. Um, you know, it, it, it won't be a frivolous thing. So, I, I really do think he had no other choice. Yes, the eunuch says I was a bit late joining today because I made a scathing video documenting that wretched geezer more cars lies mm. it's only two minutes long and safe to view uh, live if you like sorry wrong link here's the correct one shall we have a look at this small video perhaps sure. who is this more car fellow everybody's going on about? i don't know <laughs> he's, a, he's he's I'll, I'll tell you what though i don't know who he is but he's making some big enemies he's uh Got some real uh, angry people against well, him. I mean, I did go to school with him, so I do know it. I do, oh. I do know him. Uh, yeah, um, that's interesting. And I, I have, I, in fact, uh, I've heard rumors uh, rumbling that uh, Sly Sneak may release the real story of uh, hit him, me, and uh, and Morcar because we all went to school together. Well, I, I, I presume you three were the elitist uh, triangle, weren't you? Oh uh, well, it will indeed. Um, yeah. I mean. Sly is a bit of a tragic story, but uh, right, yeah. I mean, I, I hear that he's uh, you know, may release that to an extremely limited audience at some point, so mm, interesting, keep, keep an eye out for that. But uh, anyway, let, let's see what uh, years has put together here, okay. 41,000 souls. I can't be trusted with 41,000 souls, I can't be trusted with 41,000 souls. Now that you mention it, you do have a very similar accent. Trust oh, we're at school together. Um, yeah, yeah. Trust All right, come on, Tarkas. This, this is so sad, this moment here. Come on, Tarkas. <laughs> Come on, Tarkas, do something, right? <laughs> Look at Cowardly Morcar here, he's just retreating. Yeah. Well, he's a, he is an evil wizard. Come on, Tarkas. Come on, Tarkas, son. Yes. Look at this. What does he do? Just snipe with the bow. <laughs> oh, I see what he is doing. <laughs> He is, is uh, counting up the damage. <laughs> miss. <laughs> Another miss. So, Based on what Charlemagne and D tell me, I understand this is not really how you're supposed to play the game. Uh, I think I, I think Morkar may need some some quite serious help based on what uh, on what they're saying. What are you even, what's he even doing? He's <laughs> just wandering around. Not wandering around. <laughs> Come on, Tarkas. Yeah. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's a hell of a lot of damage. Thank God for that. <laughs> And the very makes it sound like it was a, an epic battle. <laughs> oh no. Here we go. The, the facts. The facts are coming out now. I can't be trusted. Oh, Morka. Oh dear, oh dear. Okay. Oh, Morka. He is an evil wizard. Poor, poor Morka. Uh, 
J Jacob says, uh, the best use of the cane is beating Charles Sumner senseless until the cane breaks. So there we go. Who's Charles Sumner and why is he so hated by uh, Jacob? Anyone know? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so basically, prior to the uh, start of the American Civil War, there was an incident in which um, a, I think Charles uh, Sumner was a Southern senator um, who uh, was pro-slavery, and he got into a fight with uh, a man called Preston Brooks in the United States Senate, um, in which he beat Brooks senseless with his cane, I believe. Uh, or, or perhaps it was the other way around. I think, I think Sumner... Sorry, I'm messing this up. I think Sumner may have been the anti-slavery uh yeah sorry he was so he was an he was an, an anti-slavery politician who was beaten very badly on, on almost to death by a man named preston brooks who was a democrat from uh south carolina um with with a cane he nearly beat him to death with a cane and uh uh many um many people in the south looked upon this as a very heroic thing so they sent uh Preston Brooks huge parcels of canes as thanks for uh, for what he for what he'd done uh, by caning this uh, filthy northerner who was trying to end slavery. So uh, let's uh, carry on then with um, uh, more super chats from the that was it for the entropy. Um, looking at the super chats proper. Ian Inkster says, the problem is not casualization, but the dressing down now involves advertising on your trousers. We can still dress up the same as ever, but forgot how to dress down. Bring back the casual tricorn. Any uh, views on that? Sorry, what, what, what was he saying at the end there? Bring back the casual tricorn. Tricorn. Is this the tricorn, uh, tricorn hat? Tricorn hat. Uh, uh, I suppose so. I'm, I'm I'm not sure I agree with that, just because, again, if you just look at the elites now compared to, to the past, like we saw with Tony Blair, where, again, he's just it, that there's the kind of the rise of the smart casual. Or if you go to any mega corporate today, you know, I've spent a lot of time in some very large institutions and um, the level of, of dress in a clerk's office in a Victorian bank compared to, um, again, a bank today is just a, is, is a world away. You know, there's been a definite um laxing of the rules and also um i i guess kind of an internationalization of styles um to make everyone the same you know you know there's a there's sort of a flattening of hierarchy through clothes that's true um it's it's part of the process into everybody becoming an amorphous mass you know it's just clothing was a it's one of the most visible signs of that happening Okay, uh, so let us. I, I just realized that I started the super chats in the middle. Um, yeah. uh, let us go down to the start. Okay, um, Coney says, Jess bought the Trivium course, Capitalism Ho. Well, uh, I hope you enjoy it, Coney. And remember, there is currently the spring sale on, spring 25 ends. May the 6th. So if you get in there now and get the Trivium, it's a good chunk off if you work out the per unit cost. So uh, Coney, ever the... Coney is the most min-max of all the Super Chats. Have you noticed that? Uh, mm. He min-maxes each Super Chat, each... And uh, I noticed he waited until the per unit cost was at, was at its lowest before he swooped in to get the Trivium. But, uh, very canny, very canny. Very canny, yeah. Uh, Emo Rap Save My Life says... Only working class people who served in the military with me have an idea what a fitted suit is. Most think a good suit fits like spandex. Yeah, I mean, what do you think of the um, of the kind of? I mean, I describe them as kind of chair fashions, but um, you know, th there was there was a whole period in the in the late uh, uh, noughties or the or the early two thousand tens where there was like a navy suit and brown shoes. You know, that was a kind of look for a while. Um, I feel like that became so ubiquitous at one point that uh, it now looks very passe. But uh, any, any, any um, news? Well, I 
quite, I'm quite a fan of blues and browns, um, particularly blue suits and brown shoes. Uh, navy, I'm not sure. Um, as, as to his point about like people thinking that they have to be like spandex, I think that people either tend to have suits that are too big or or, or too tight, um, you know, or, or they'll, they'll they'll go to like Moss Moss Bros and they'll they'll buy a suit that's you know like it's it technically fits them but it's like a really skinny cut on like a like a like a man that's quite sort of not not, not even big just just not skinny so it looks I mean it, th those suits look bad on this on on, on the skinny models so. They really don't look good on uh, on like most blokes either, you know. Uh, so I, I would say av avoid that sort of thing. Just make sure it's a, the in the perfect in between point of comfort and um, uh, style. So obviously, you know, a suit that's really like loose and and ill fitting would be comfortable, but would look terrible. So you want to edge it away from that. But at the same time, just go for a a standard sort of. Uh, uh, Widish leg cut of trousers and make sure that the jacket isn't too big around the chest. That's there's, what you want to watch out for. There's one James Bond film with Daniel Craig in it where I think his suit is ridiculously tight and he looks. Would like that be? Player. Would that be Spectre? It's the one where it's the one which has got like an extended chase on the roof on the rooftops and he literally looks like a gorilla running it. Like <laughs> yeah, running it, it's 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 a sign of the last. 10 years it, it, it's been fashionable and i think now that we're into another decade it may change um we may go a different way but yeah very very tight trousers especially are, are a big thing which i've never really liked um lord megatron says you don't see faces like nora batty anymore you no longer see stern and stoic men like uh lamaya we have so many more tatty herberts now than then so, uh, yep. Uh, Prince Prince of Palmer says, AA for Uber Iron. <laughs> uh, JD says, basic clothing advice, get a good physique, don't be afraid to buy decent shoes, no branded items, and never let a woman dress you. Trust me, don't. <laughs> well, that's where I've been going wrong. I'm, 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 not, I'm not necessarily against, like, buying some branded items, but I think I think there's... Again, just keep things subtle is is my advice. And uh, on the physique point, I think I think it's true. If you want to look good, you need to uh, you know be in a good physical state. But I think like we saw with some of those kind of more rotund gentlemen at the start, uh, you know, clothes can definitely help you <laughs> help your silhouette. Let's just say so. Um, yeah, you 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 fit the clothes to you. You know, don't you don't you don't fit yourself to the clothes because you'll just look bad if you do that. JD says, base, uh, sorry, uh, Chris Lutio says, what caused the decline of dress utilitarianism? I honestly think it's Americanism personally. But, I mean. Yeah, like uh, I think I think that if you saw that 40s moment where again, uh, again, the kind of casual collar, the lack of uh, tie, the zoot, the zoot suit, but again, that, that just spells kind of like the casual attitude, the more adventurous individualistic styles coming in. Mm -hmm. so, again, so again, I think we, we sort of, We've lost that kind of um, like the idea of national styles or kind of the localism through clothes, and you lose hierarchy. Um, so I, I think it definitely World War Two in my mind is is that point. Yeah. Uh, let's carry on. Um, uh, Michael Nocter says thoughts on wearing a fez hat or should I wear a bowler hat instead? Also, any gentlemanly clothing advice for someone who sweats easily in the sun? Uh. Two things: um, wear a fez if you're in a country where they wear fezes. Um, don't walk down, you know, the middle of like Rochester High Street in a fez. Although I suppose there is a, a humour to be made there of the fact of the sort of ethnicity of the people that you'd probably see in Rochester High Street. <laughs> um, but I mean, um, in 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 effect, I mean, I, I'm always very sad to see that um, Ataturk like banned the fez from Turkey, um, or he like did ma major things to sort of cull it off as a as a as a trend. Um, so I don't know where the fez is popular still, or if it is popular still. But I actually really like the look of um, Edwardian period, like uh, Ottoman, you know, like people in suits with with a fez. I, I really like that look. Or say, um, you know, like young King Farouk of Egypt or anything like that. I I, I really like the fez. And uh, if I if I was of, of Middle Eastern origin or in a Middle Eastern country, I would maybe try one. But uh, yeah, I, I actually do have a fez, but it's not really a proper one. But I, I, I never wear it. It's just for for uh, novelty. And um, as to the point of uh, somebody that sweats in the heat easily, um, I would say what you want to do is go for 
if you if you want to keep it casual, just wear a shirt, like a, a light a light shirt, soft shirt, with a linen blazer, um, and you should be fine, and you'll look good. If you want to go for a, if you want to keep, then obviously you can just add, you can add a tie to that or a sort of thin waistcoat. But just the thing to bear in mind is that obviously, like if you just wear like a t-shirt and some swim shorts, you're obviously going to be less, slightly less hot than if you wear like a suit. But the reason you're wearing a suit is because you want to look good. And style in that case will come before comfort. So, you know, you you may sweat, but you may just have to put up with the sweat. Um, if, if, if you sweat so much, it's coming through the clothes, invest in an undershirt. So that isn't just like a vest or a t-shirt, but an actual men's undershirt, um, because it will absorb all the sweat and it won't show on your clothing. Uh, and also it doesn't make you too hot because it wicks, it wicks the sweat off, off your body and keeps, keeps in a sort of an airflow. Um, which will be, which will be good. Uh, that'll, that'll keep you cool. Um, I mean, again, I'm at the point now where I'm, I'm so used to wearing a suit or sort of that style of clothing all the time. So that like when it, when it is the summer, provided that you wear the, that you wear the, the right thing, you just wear like a linen suit without, without a coat, then you're fine. You don't feel too hot at all. Um, it's much a matter of a, uh, the material and B you'll, you'll get used to it. And if you want if you have to sweat because you're wearing a suit, then you'll sweat. You just have to put up with it. I know, in, I know in Iran, uh, they wear this uh, very thin kind of vest under all of their clothes. That's almost like, because obviously a very hot country. So um, that seems to be very common there to have. Uh, Kony says, uh, look up Congo dandies. Yeah, these, these, these chaps are quite fun. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. the, Con the Congo dandies, the uh, sapeurs, I think they're called. Yes. Yeah. Look at them. There was a cursed, uh, was it like a Guinness advert or something that's... Yeah, they appeared in that, I think, or Stella. Here are, the, here are the Congo dandies. So these chaps are part of a movement in African countries, some African countries, but most mostly the Congo and uh, Central African, sorry, Central African countries that aims to, like, among all the poverty and the unhappiness of living there, they will save, they will work and work and work for years and save up lots of money and then buy and then spend it all on some very lavish tailoring um and uh, part of the reason this comes from the congo is that uh uh, uh of course the congo was a belgian colony with a lot of french influences and a lot of the kind of parisian high fashion tailoring style that that, that sort of went there with the colony to serve whites that were living out there um it, it survived partially. Like a lot of these old um, tailoring shops still exist in the Congo and another sort of uh, Frank Francophone places. Um, so again, that's where these come from. These, these men will go and spend enormous amounts of money that they've worked very hard to save just, just to look like this. It's, it's basically, you know, it's, it's in the midst of all the, of all the bleakness of, of where they live. They're just saying, you know what, we're just going to put on a, 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 a sort of funky looking suit and, have a good time, I suppose. That's what it is. And frankly, I, I don't really see how this is a, a bad thing. You know, it's, it's quite admirable. Uh, I suppose you might say that, well, they could spend the money on on, on something nicer, or, you know, or some something more long lasting. But frankly, I, I think this is a very good way of, uh, of, I, of doing it. I, you know, they, to, they take I, pride in it. I have to share this guy's glasses. <laughs> glasses. I mean, look at that. I love the cane as well. That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, the Congo dandies. I didn't know about them before. Um, uh, Coney also says, compare Ascot in the 1910s to modern Ascot slags. Um, just don't mind says, all this reveals is the narcissism of the elites. Uh, any comeback on that? It's, it's, again, uh, if, if you want to have hierarchy, you need to differentiate yourselves. So it's like, again, I, they're, they're gonna, there is a lot of this kind of snootiness about elites by people who are elitist you know so i don't, I don't know what you want you know <laughs> this is it, it, as, as soon as you differentiate your, differentiate yourself in society you you will need to stand out so uh, there, there it is tied to narcissism in in some degree but at the same time i think it's a there is a bigger and deeper meaning to it as well just don't mind also says the suit is the male equivalent of the push-up bra i don't get that sort, sort of it's like, like, it makes you look good it looks it makes you look better than uh you are. I, th I think there's a truth to that for sure. It They're does. It does. It does. It does if you do it right. You know, a, a suit can easily make you look awful uh, if you don't do it properly. Just, 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 just keep that in mind. 
Ian Inkster says the problem is not, uh, we did that one. White Raven says, check out the Handbook of Style, A Man's Guide to Looking Good by Esquire. It's more modern, but it's view of men's fashion, in its view of men's fashion, but it's still great for newbies. Mm -hmm. Handbook of Style. I've heard uh, about that. Valero 39, uh, 393 says, to my fellow Reds, keep leveling up in terms of learning and ideological commitment. With this super chat, I just made it to 6.201. <laughs> He's trying to trying to become a 10. I mean, if you dressed, if you if you were dressed by, if you were dressed according to Panama hats, um, uh, Panama hats uh, tips here, uh, and you work your way through the trivium, um, you, you probably go up a whole level, I reckon. Mm -hmm. you... uh, whole whole point. <laughs> whole point, yeah. Um, Darth Arebius says, fashion show between the hosts. Uh, I mean, I don't want to be a part of any fashion show. Maybe, uh, you know, I'm, if you if you guys want to get on a catwalk, I'll, I'll be pleased to host it. But uh, no, 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 I'm not parading about. Jenna and I, and Cringe Cringewalk says dress codes at the meetups would filter out the less than eights. Well, I mean, you've certainly put a pressure on the uh, certainly put a pressure to uh, t to look good, I guess. But um, I mean, I guess it gives me something to aim at as well. I, I will definitely know. be dressing up. We all conference. have to dress up, dress up at the uh, at the uh, at the event. Um, and oh, but by the way, I should mention uh, if you want to know more about that event, it is in the it is in the in the show notes as well under event. Um, Harrison Wade says I'm medically exempt from rank tr tr truckery. And anywhere somewhere says games industry vet here, deepest lore on Street Fighter, please. I can walk you through why four had so many versions. Um, yeah, I could do a Street Fighter. Uh, yeah, maybe. We're, we're, we're doing Boulder's Gate next month. I know that much. Uh, Time Stealers coming on. Um, yeah, we could do Street Fighter. I don't see why not. Uh, JD says, thoughts on the double-breasted waistcoats? Uh, I'm quite a fan of them. Um, I Honestly, uh, I do tend to stick with the uh, the usual sort of, of waistcoat. This is the single-breasted one, but double-breasted ones are an interesting... Uh, uh, sort of take on the waistcoat. Um, they go well with most of them. Uh, just bear in mind that a a double-breasted one is generally very square on on its bottom part. So normal waistcoats have a, like a nice V that sort of hangs down from your waist, but this, the double-breasted ones the double-breasted ones cut off at the bottom. So make sure that your your trousers are very high waisted so that you don't get a gap. You don't there's there's no shirt showing between the waistcoat and the trousers. Um. Where are we here? Harrison Wade, Mrs. A.A. told me that she isn't real and you invented her to frame your arguments to your advantage. Believe all women. Yeah, unfortunately for Mrs. A.A., she is real. Um, also, we've heard AAA several times now. So if that mm. was the case, A.A. would have had to hire a small child actor to come in for those, I mean, for those moments. Somewhere, That's commitment. Somewhere in the deepest, darkest archives, you can hear Mrs. A.A. She used to do the credits. Oh, yes, yeah. And yeah, that's right. Whole, the, game, the Game of Thrones stream We as also well. did a yeah. whole five-hour stream talking about Game of Thrones, which yeah. is on there. Now, now Mrs. A.A. Um, is very keen to play Morkar on Soul Calibur. She, she thought it might be fun to play Soul Calibur. But um, we'll, we'll see about that. I'm not keen on Great. the evil... On the evil wizard meet, meeting my missus to be honest um harrison wade says did you guys uh, discuss evola's concentration camps for blue jeans wearing women <laughs> i don't think i, I don't think Evola <laughs> ever advocated such a thing um <laughs> megan uh, megan isa shan says panama when woodhouse started working for the hsbc bank on lombard street in a nutshell what was his style am i channeling a stripe or two uh, I'd have to want if you give me a moment. Uh, have a look. Uh, PG Woodhouse in the at the at the bank. Uh, I'm not well. I'm not specifically aware what he wore, uh, unless it's a reference to one of his books that I'm not getting. Okay, um, and then finally, uh, Harold says, "Watch Guy Ritchie talking about suits on JRE." Is that Joe Rogan? Guy Ritchie went on Joe okay. Rogan. I haven't watched Joe, Joe Rogan for a long time, so I missed well, it. I, I've never watched Joe Rogan, but uh, okay. Oh, and uh, Lord Megatron's come in with a last minute one saying full Highland dress for the meetups. Uh, for me, then, bagpipes intensify. 
So, uh, yeah, what, what do you think about the uh, the Scots turning up in a kilt? Is that, is that good, do you think? I think it's good because it's, uh, again, it reflects where they're from. You know, I, th I think I, I don't like to see kilt, kilt LARPers, but again, if that's your heritage, then you should use it, so... Okay. Yeah. Just make sure you're a Scot, basically, if you want to wear a kilt. And I mean, there's a whole, um, like, that's a whole separate thing, how to wear kilts and, and uh, sporins and the the, uh, the type of, of boots and the socks and everything. Get the, I, I, I'm not Scottish, so I don't wear it. So you'd have to talk to somebody who's, who is and wears it. All right. Well, I think it was quite good. Uh, quite a good, uh, from the sounds of things, we are, uh, time is up because I can hear a certain... Uh, <laughs> but um yeah do you have anything you want to share shell uh panama hat shell uh shell. shell yes please subscribe to uh my my channel we, we, we're doing a uh a look into the uh art of dictators on the sunday this this week so sort of seeing um what kind of artistic values did certain dictators present? And then what do they have in their personal collections? Because it was often very different and uh, some interesting uh, thoughts. So if you're into art and arty things, go to the description, follow me and uh, subscribe. Yeah, and uh, I, I, will just, I will just mention, of course, uh, yet again, that the sale is on spring 25 till May the 6th. There's a lot of people uh, who are like, oh, what about me? I'm a... I'm poor. What can I do? Well, look, for this limited period, the price has dropped a little bit. So, get it while uh, get it while you can. And uh, yes, uh, somebody's saying to you, AA, do you trust Morcar with Mrs. A? No, I don't. He's evil. He's an evil wizard. So uh, he cannot be trusted. Uh, even even though he's an old school friend, he cannot be trusted at all. I would never trust that man. Um, okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Now get out. <laughs>